Good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's the 3rd of May. <clears throat> NHS Lancashire South can be an integrated care board. We welcome apologies this morning from Jane <coughs> O'Brien. Um, everyone, very welcome. Thank you for people who've come along for the interest that you have in business of the ICB this morning. Of no new declarations of interest, I'll just ask again for, uh, as we get into specific discussions, if you want to feel uh, conflicted or there's a perceived conflict in any way, please just um, raise that at the time. We last met on the 29th of March and we've got the minutes here. I don't, I don't think Michael Green was at our last meeting. No. So there's an amendment to, I think Michael's presence had carried forward from the previous meeting. We'll make that amendment. Are there any other points anyone wishes to raise on the <coughs> We can tend to can we them in, please? Thank you, Roy. <coughs> now we've got the action log of matters arising. Um, Debbie, there were a number of points out of the, out of the discussion from last time about. Uh, follow up with further involvement of the patient involvement engagement group. Could you just give us a brief update on where you're at with that <coughs> work, please, and then we can close this outstanding item. Both of the items that were identified that pay a conflict to offer additional assurance against are being considered by the committee. So we met last week and both of those items have actually been included in the planner. So whilst we've not picked it up, they are scheduled for the next meeting, which will be in June. So what we'll be able to do is through the minutes from the meeting, report back and give you the assurance that we've offered to, to provide. Thank you. Excellent. Everybody content? Thank you very much. I'm going to change the order around a little bit. Um, we'll go into the... Chief Executive's report next, then the patient story, then the business from the committees before we get into the two main uh, discussions around community services, um, primary care and the implementation of Fuller. So I'll carry it over to you. Okay, uh, today's agenda is all about um, community issues. We've got three important papers on, on, on the agenda, I think, from that perspective. Uh, the reconfiguration of community services, our response to the fuller report on primary care, and the partnership uh, agreement uh, with the voluntary uh, sector. At our next board meeting, we will have uh, proposals for devolution and delegation to place, and we will follow that with uh, place presentations at each board meeting going forward as well. So we're really seeing a significant ramping up of our focus on, on community issues. Um, I do think though, I, I was at, at the privilege of chairing a confed session on, on plays, and there was a classic quote in that discussion, which I think we should bear in mind. So yeah, listening by the ICB is probably more important Budget delegation. So I think sometimes we do get carried away with the sort of bureaucratic issues around it, but um, real devolution is more about listening to what people have got to say and doing things differently in the light of that, really. On the community services, I mean, we'll obviously deal with that when we get to the item. Uh, the main decision is around <coughs> progressing a change in the Blackburn and Darwin area. But I do I do also want to just highlight the need to deal with the Central Lancashire issue. We've got a very fragmented approach in Central Lancashire. We saw from the board reports and the challenges we've got in that area, so that needs to be um, high in our mind. I mean, I think the plan is to progress changes 
to implement in 24, 25 financial year. But that's a, that's a really, it's the one area in our system that's very, very different compared to the others. Um, we have also reached agreement with NHSE on, on budget for the system, so we will brief you in part two on, on the issues there, but that's a big uh, milestone. Um, and I think probably the big issue now is to move from budget planning into budget delivery, which is the thing that's been uh, working me awake at night, really. That's going to be the big challenge. We've got, some, we've got a very challenging budget this year. It's going to take a lot of uh, rigour, and, and it will need a lot of attention from the board uh, going forward. Uh, and again, we'll update you. We've got a report on where we've effectively rag rated our own savings programme and with the providers, <coughs> their position and the position on the, the various PCB uh, projects as well. So we'll update you on that as part of um, as part of the uh, part two. So I'm happy to answer any questions, Chair. Any questions for the Chief Executive? Comments? Response? Reflection? Sorry, no questions. I always find this report really useful, so thank you, Kevin. And I say to my local authority colleagues, if you do nothing else, just read um, Kevin's report, it will give you a good overview, so I find that really helpful. Just two comments. Um, firstly, in terms of the integrated care strategy, that does also have to be signed off by the um, local authorities as well as your joint partners. So I think we just need to be clear um, that that needs to be signed off by a range of people and that's going through due process at the moment. Don't envisage any problems with that because we've worked um, together, but it's important that we're aware of that. Um, in terms of the Hewitt review, we've agreed as local authorities, up to local authorities, we're going to have a collective discussion about that and then probably co-join um, with some of the ICB executives so that we've got a shared and common view on that um, as we move it forward. And then finally, and Kevin knows I'm going to say this, um, it would really be helpful from a local government perspective if we avoided the terminology of devolution. It has a completely different context and it can cause friction. So it's not a great way to start a positive conversation with local governments. So it's just one of those subtle nuances that we just need to work on together. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. Excellent. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you, Chair. So today's story, and we have got a video, although it's not, um, the family didn't want to be filmed, so we've got some narrators reading out the story. It's still quite powerful when you listen to it. And we did, for those um, members who are also a member of the Quality Committee, we did um, review this story at Quality Committee. So just to set the scene before we listen to the story, it is about dementia and the impact that that has had, not only on the patient, but on the family in particular. And just a few stark facts for us. And I think also it's a really pertinent patient story given the theme today on community services and primary care. So we've got currently, um, the estimate is by 2025, there'll be 1 million people living with dementia in the UK. And that that is going to rise to 2 million by 2051. So this is a real challenge for us as health and care providers. It's not now, this really surprised me actually, I didn't know this, it is now the leading cause of death in England of Wales, which I hadn't appreciated. And um, it's estimated, given the financial challenges in the whole of the NHS and local government, that dementia costs the UK economy about 34.7 billion a year in terms of care, and that's across health and social care. And I think the last thing I'd say before we listen to the story is, I think it's a really good example when you listen to the story of why true integrated working and collaboration between health, local government, voluntary sector and families and carers, because I think another really important point for me is listening to the experiences of families and carers and letting them shape the support that they need. I think that comes out in this story very, very strongly. So I'm glad you that. <clears throat> My mother, Ethel, was in her 90s when she died last year and while I was caring for her I, I observed her deterioration and sadly her death. 
About five years ago, my mum started having auditory hallucinations and she started falling and started becoming forgetful. She lost her ability to concentrate and she seemed to have a perpetually runny nose, um, which I've since found out is a symptom of dementia with Lewy bodies. Mum's symptoms got worse and it was clear she needed more than just my support. She needed professional carer support. The quality of the support was mixed. Some experiences of poor support and that was a big stressor for me and my family. As mum's symptoms got worse, she began to suffer from insomnia and this affected my sleep pan. I also suffered from insomnia as a result of all the worry and anxiety. Mum began to lose her memory, she got confused, she had false or mixed memories and that was very distressing. She began to find it hard to cope with technology, so using her panic alarm or being able to tell between the doorbell and the telephone. She wasn't eating well and, and she wouldn't take her medication. I was caught between my real love for my mum and a sense of duty and the pressure of the worry and anxiety about mum's well-being. Mum's deafness became a problem because she didn't like or she didn't remember to wear her hearing aids and this made her confused and she got more aggressive with her confusion. Mum was doubly incontinent from about 12 months before she moved into a care home. So there was the emotional and practical challenge of helping your mother, who's doubly incontinent, as well as the financial cost of purchasing appropriate products because the products available on the NHS just weren't suitable. Because mum was becoming more confused and aggressive, I managed to move her to a care home with a special unit for aggressive patients. Sadly, mum died before her 98th birthday. The memory clinic that mum was referred to was very helpful. Uh, the service was supportive and informative. But I do wonder if people, GPs and nurses mainly, I do wonder if they know about it. Mum came to the service quite late in the day and although it did help her, I do wonder if it would have been more useful earlier on. So although my experience is like many people's, every dementia patient is very different and it's important this is recognised. I really think early diagnosis access to information and support and trained, skilled and aware health professionals and a high quality care sector are really important. Getting support from other people who've been through what I went through was helpful too. Doing the right thing for loved ones with dementia is very, very hard. The role of family in the care of someone with dementia needs to be recognised. Family carers are unpaid carers and we know about our loved ones. Myself and others like me have insights that can help health professionals and the health service. that was a very powerful and impactful story but really shows how getting it right and wrapping support around the family in an integrated way and um, understanding the impact it has on the carers as well as on the patient is really important and I hope some of the papers we've got on today and our commitment to community centric services working in true partnership <coughs> at place with all the relevant partners is a key to um, improving the experience of people like Sue and their family. Thank you. Jeff. Um, this week, in clinical practice, I've had some real challenges with people with mental health, and I've had some real challenges with um, people with frailty. But the biggest challenge is every week, and this week is no exception, looking after dementia patients. Sarah, 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 Sarah's right, you know, it's, it, it was the leading cause of death in my practice before I retired from it. About half of all deaths were due to dementia, that's because we've had success through cardiovascular disease and cancer and other things, isn't it? And people are living longer and moving into this. So it's, it's a big volume of work. And I know I'm in danger of repeating myself, but there's a lot of people with dementia and they live for quite a long time. They don't, it's not like getting a, a rapidly advancing cancer where you might be dead within 12 months. You, you, you live for a few years. And so you've got a lot of people living for a lot of time with a lot of problems. That creates this big box of, of work, and, and, and the work is difficult. Um, the, the story, the story to me brings out lots of things. But two two things I might mention is one is as you mentioned early diagnosis. There's lots of people with dementia who don't get recognised for quite a long time, uh, include included by including relatives and doctors and nurses and the like. So 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 awareness is really key. Uh, and the other thing is. What really helps families, and what uh, I, I don't think happened here, is early 
from the early awareness, early care planning, <coughs> by, 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 by and, and bringing a team around, around people, because th these people don't need lots of medicine, but they need help with housing and care, um, you know, uh, legal things like finances and, and power of attorneys. There's a whole host of things that need to be done for these people. And the earlier she's done, the more that person, who will still have mental capacity at that stage early on, can take part in that planning. So, so it's, a, it's a big volume of work, and it, to me, it, it's a key one um, for, for place, place and neighbourhood teams to help deliver on. It's where everyone comes together around the patient. Uh, so, so I think we need to recognise it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big task, and it's a, it's a worthy one if we can do it well. Um, it's a good sort of echo of some of Jeff's comments. I think you know, hearing the stories, some key points, early diagnosis, inflammation. And I think she also underlined, I think she said, every patient is different. And I think as a starting point, we, we need to look at this from a, more of a macro level. And Sarah mentioned the rate that dementia diagnosis increasing. Is it increasing even faster in some of our communities, significantly faster? Yeah in some of our main communities. And in these communities, diagnosis is, is done later. And that's what the evidence is saying. So I think there's an understanding of our communities and a tailored approach required yeah. for these communities. And I recall that the uh, Cheshire and Mersey sites were the mental health trust were pilot sites where they were working with care homes uh, to so proactive diagnosis. Uh, so 14 sites across across the country. And I think some evidence from that would be useful to see if there's any learning, learning for us. Mm -hmm. The final point is around the role of digital technology in this space. Uh, so National Institute for Health and Care issues has put in £10 million of funding for six projects. One is around uh, using apps to monitor sort of mental health and early sort of memory problems. So that I think that there's some real good technology studies out there that will help with diagnosis and technology to help with assisted living as well. The same things like medication, reminders sort of technology. So there's, there's technology angle in terms of supporting living as well. So I think just to end on that is that early diagnosis, understanding our community and the role of technology as well in this space. Thank you, Ashley. Very helpful. Got Jim, Tracy, Chris. Hey, Jim. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, it was a powerful story. Thank you. <coughs> a lot of that I've sort of heard before. I, I always think we should take something away from this and try and do something on, on the topic. <coughs> and the one thing that struck me, though, that I've not heard before was about the incontinence products that are available on the NHS not being adequate. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've you know, not come across that before. And I don't know whether we shouldn't be, you know, in terms of takeaway and an action we will do, whether we should be looking into that and seeing whether there's something we can do to address that on an ongoing basis, because it must affect a huge number of people. It must have a real big impact on many families. Thank you. And the other point that came up was about the Emory clinics as well. Do we, is, is this something that is easier to access in some parts of our packs than others? Or? I might be good with Chris answers. I'll come to Chris in a sec. Yeah. I'll go to Tracy first. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah, because we're really powerful story as other people have said. Um, one of the things that, that came out of it for me was the the way in which Sue described it, not knowing what's available and, and other professionals not knowing what's available. And um, it, it kind of had a real impact on me that because I spent the day yesterday interviewing social prescribing link workers for a piece of research we're doing around um, the, the views of, of link workers in terms of the service that, that's delivered. And one of the messages that came out loud and clear from that was that they know what's available in the community and that is why they are working so effectively with people around a whole range of health conditions, a whole range of mental health conditions and, and um, things like financial problems because what they can do quite quickly is connect people with the services that they need. So I think there's definitely something in that for me in terms of how we, because that, that, that is patchy as well as across Lancashire and South Cymru in terms of where social prescribing link workers sit, um, how they deliver services, 
who they're connecting with. And I think it's an opportunity for the sector that I work in to very much work in partnership around very, very quick services where somebody can be referred to a link worker um, and get that wraparound range of support, whether it's help um, with things like power of attorney and, and financial support, which is absolutely crucial at that time where there's a diagnosis or prior to the diagnosis, but also the things that, that Asim talked about in terms of those disparities as well in communities. You know, trusted people in communities are absolutely <coughs> vital when you're looking at uh, where people are going to go and the help they're going to access. Thanks, Tracy. Should I help Chris, please? Um, so the service that Ethel would be referred into would be the memory assessment service, which is run by LSEIT. And whilst access is universal, the level or the service specification is not. So within Central and um, Lancashire, it's a one-stop clinic. So you get a um, diagnostic consultant assessment and leave with a diagnosis all on the one, at the one clinic. Other areas within the patch, because of previous commissioning of by CCGs, <coughs> it's a fragmented. So you would call it, you'd have a diagnostic, you might get sent to secondary care for a scan, you might then come back and see a consultant and over a number of, of weeks. So I think what we can take from this, taking Jim's piece about action, is to do a, a, a review across Lancaster and South Cumbria to see what is the provision where uh, and what is, obviously that one-stop clinic is gold service, that's what we should be providing. Um, and look at then how we're publishing that with, with GPs to make sure that there is an awareness of those clinics. Um, I, you know, I've sat in both one in, in Central and one in Blackburn with Darwin. The different the, the experience of, of patients once they're referred into different service specifications is quite stark. Um, so we'll, we'll take that away. Yeah. Very important. Thank you. David, please. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to further Jim's point around the content services, and this is something that we hear about quite a lot. So um, it sounds like they were inadequate in that. Um, uh, story that we've heard there, but but we hear that over and over again, and it's something that perhaps we don't uh, we shy away from talking about, maybe. But I can't imagine anything that has an impact more on a person's dignity than not, not you know managing continents well. So um, the other thing that we hear a lot of, about really is that, that the appropriateness of our models of care. So you know the fact that people are left having been incontinent for many hours before their next care visit. Um, and I mean, I don't know whether or not you know how people feel about that, but certainly if that was my parent um, that was having to, to, to stay in that state for many hours, I think that's completely unacceptable. So I think we need to have a look at that, and uh, and if we certainly do that is the position that people are left in um, in our patch. So, so I think that's unacceptable, and also um, access and appropriateness of the continent services I think is a challenge as well. So um, I think this is an area that needs work and and. Thank you, David. That's very helpful. Back to Jeff. Just to pick up on Tracy's point, um, you need to know what's available. You don't know what you don't know. And it, it's proved in the history of the NHS difficult to maintain knowledge in individuals about everything. So people have tried directories and paper directories get out of date very quickly, try computer directories and they get out, they don't get used now out of date. What we did in, 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 in South Cumbria. Uh, through our integrated neighbourhood teams um, that, that, were, that were, we, we appointed care navigators. And these were people who kept themselves up to date with all the services available for all the conditions that would come up, like frailty, frailty like, like dementia, mental health things. So they would become the expert in where to send people. So, so the, the standards, the modus operandi was, was really see someone, assess someone, get a diagnosis of dementia, and then, and then get them run through the system through, through our MDTs and use that care navigator who would know, at the moment, this is what's available in Barrow, this is what's available in Kendall, etc. So you need that local knowledge, you need those, those local people, because I don't know, I'm not convinced that any other system will work, uh, so, but it can be done, and it was done quite successfully. Um, and, and just, I think, picking up a little bit on, 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 on Chris's point, I think... Um, I think to get the memory clinics uh, used, used, there's a commissioning issue. But there's also an issue of how, how, how people refer people. And I, I, that's where I think computer-based um, systems that, 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 that uh, help you with diagnosis, with pro prompts in computers with various conditions. Which, and we have really good computer systems that will do that. Um, and and template-based 
record keeping, which actually prompts you to say, okay, so we've got some dementia, now we need to ask these questions, assess these things and the like. So there are ways that, that, that there are tools there that we can use to, to, to make this really good. We don't have to invent much stuff, we just need to use it consistently. Thank you. Kevin, do you screen do you risk assess admissions or attendances and screen people systematically? Yes, we do. So, I mean, if you think about a, a large acute hospital, a large portion of the patients in there, a portion of the patients in there will have dementia as well as um, other physical conditions. And we do have a number of dementia-friendly wards where the environment is, is, is made and has been adapted to cope with dementia patients. So there is, so, so we do have that screening. But what really struck me from that story, and I think it goes on to some of the agenda items that we've got, what we don't have, I think, is that seamless service between somebody coming into an acute hospital and then the support in a community or a primary care setting. And I think what we need to do, and I'm going to take, take away from this story, is much more about how do we get those integrated services and how do we tie up the care between somebody who's had their physical needs assessed and dealt with from a secondary care that then needs to go into a community and primary care setting so that we've got that seamless transfer. I don't think we get that right yet. Okay. Abdul, anything you want to add to the discussion? There's nothing, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sarah, number of takeaway yes. points in continent service and support, yeah. access to best practice, yeah. memory clinics, pathway, yeah. coming out of lost And I think so much of that will come, come back with some of that. Yeah, I think a lot of that will be part of that community services okay. transformation work as well. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go back to the committee uh, reports, please. Sheena first. Yes, thanks very much. Um, so, um, things that I'd just like to pull out uh, for the uh, the board are uh, the patient safety and the response framework, which we have talked about before. Um, but I think what I'd just like to highlight with the board again is the opportunity this presents for um, taking that system-wide view. And that's really important, if you just go back to the story we just heard about dementia, that integrated care is that increasingly looking at um, people's safety, their effectiveness and their experience from a system perspective is really, really important because that's where we really make those so that bit about being person-centred rather than organisationally siloed. Um, so I think you know, the more that we look <coughs> at uh, the implementation of the patient safety improvement framework in that system way, I think the more that we'll, we'll really start to think about <coughs> that dimension about people where, you know, in their communities and looking at in a different lens and just from a, an organisational lens. The other thing that we um, considered when we looked at the progress against this, which is really positive in Lancaster and South Cumbria, um, is the, the fact that there are other sources of intelligence that we can start to bring in. Um, and we had a discussion about um, what we discussed, for example, at overview and scrutiny committees, um, which is another lens that we can bring in uh, that in terms of, of what's going on. Uh, I think the other thing I just wanted to, to mention was uh, we did have a good discussion of, about anti-barrier placements and had a presentation from Fleur and from Deb B. Um, Fleur talking about the mental health aspects of anti-barrier placements and the plans around that, and Debbie about um, learning disabilities. Um, and uh, what I just want to bring as an alert back to the board was the fact that whilst there are plans in place that are really positive around moving forward the uh, mental health um, reduction in uh, people who end up out of area uh, for their, their inpatient care with learning disabilities, that's going to take us <coughs> a much longer trajectory through to 2025 about really getting introducing those two reasons. One is the development of appropriate assessment and treatment facilities, inpatient facilities in the Lancashire and South Cumbria geographical area, and also the further development of community services. I just wanted to just bring that to the attention of members Thank you. Any points for Sheena, please? That's good. I think we're getting into a... We're not finely tuned yet, but we're getting into a better rhythm now of how business comes and reported from uh, Committee of Other Minutes from your last 
meeting machine were very good, thank you. Jim, audit committee, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll pick one from each section. I'm, I'm advised, just to, to confirm, that we are progressing the accounts on the final, uh, the annual report. It's not been absolutely seamless, and the, and the Q1 CCP accounts are proving still quite difficult to complete. So uh, that, we will get there, we're pretty sure we'll get there, but it's not been as easy as perhaps we were hoping. Under Assure, it was good to, to pick out an internal audit report that the ICP quality team has the processes and mechanisms in place to monitor the quality of services. That was that was sort of potentially a, a gap, but it's not a gap. So what they're telling us is we've actually got good systems in place to do that, so that was helpful. And under Alert, you'll see there's a couple of uh, two or three items there relating to aspects of governance where we're only going to get them to Assure at all. We're having things highlighted as potential problem areas. And as a board, I think we will need to pay a bit more attention to the items listed under that alert section. Um, so just, not an early warning, but we need to be aware that there are governance aspects that the board needs to sharpen up on. Thank you. So we're into our second business year now. We still don't know what our opening balances were on the day we first started until the CCG accounts closed. Is there problem that you allude to capacity or capability of audit or is it just a complexity it's, somehow in the numbers? I think it's around the um, the availability of audit. So the, one of the audit companies have proved rather difficult in terms of getting them to do the work that they are committed to doing. So they're actually pushing it right to the limits of the time scale available. So something that we could have we would say they could have done a lot of this months ago. They didn't. But we pretty com I'm talking to Sam as well. We're pretty confident <coughs> about what the the outcome of the audit will be, or are we vulnerable yeah. to, to surprises in that. No, I'm th I think I think we're fairly confident it'll be, it'll be okay. It's just really completing the tasks now and getting the external auditors to complete the work. So we we're working with them, and, and as Jim said, it. There's no reason at this stage to think there's going to be an issue, but it is pushed to the wire in terms of time. Okay. Thank you. Any questions, points for Jim? All right. Thank you. I don't think people bored from that since last time. Maybe they don't know for any sort of 24. Okay. Debbie, anything you want to add to what you made before? Please? Yeah, so just a few points from the PAC meeting which was last week. So from an assurance perspective, we took a, a look at a couple of things in depth. So one was the integrated care strategy, which would obviously come through to board as an updated version. So the committee looked at um, the work that had been done in the second stage of involvement and engagement to give assurance. Um, and whilst we were overall insured, we will be linking back um, with the ICP to offer support to strengthen around ethnicity. So when we looked at the data and the, uh, the views that were gathered, there was an opportunity to gather a much stronger voice from people of different um, ethnic groups, which we felt would strengthen the work. So we'll work with the ICP to do that and to achieve it. Um, and on that point, what we learned was that it's really important that internally we connect the comms and engagement team with the population health team because they're both doing some fantastic work and by working together we can offer better support to the ICP um, through reach and not doing things twice. Um, we looked at the NHS forward plan comes and engagement strategy and again we gave assurance on that and some quite helpful feedback that we know will be taken forward and it will come back to us ahead of it going to board so we can take another look at that. Um, and then we also had an updated insights and assurance report which gave a really helpful update against the breadth of activity that the ICB is delivering now um, at community level in particular. So we'll commend that report to people. It's publicly available on the website, but it does give you a really good sense of what we're doing, what we're hearing, the trends, the patterns that are coming back. Um, there's no alerts, but a couple of points for advice. So one is around, we'll continue work to strengthen place representation at the table, actually in the committee meetings and outside of the meetings. It's really important that we get that voice from communities. Um, and that link with the directors of healthcare integration, both in terms of the model, but the richness of the feedback as well, so it's seen within the committee's forum. And then a really practical one, so we talked about patient stories, so we're having some fantastic patient stories like the one we've just had from Sue, but we recognise that it's as important as hearing the stories, it's actually letting people know what we've thought and what we've done as a result of them. 
So we want to work with quality committee to have a systematic feedback to patients who shared the views so that they know that we've heard what we've understood and actually what we're doing about it as a result so that they get that peace of mind really that we're, we're acting where we can and what they've, they've heard and told us. Thank you. Excellent. Any questions for Debbie? I think we've got a really good rhythm in your committee now. Very pleased with that. Thank you. Roy, I don't think you've met since last time. We've not met, no. We meet next week. We waited for the month to work with us. It's just on the agenda for today. Okay. And David, Primary Care Commissioner, please. So, two things. First of all, although it's under a shore, you can see that the Buper Dental Services across the country, um, they have closed. 85 practices of which seven are, um, sorry, five of which were in Langston, South Cumbria. So uh, we have described in the past the, the fragility of some of the dental services across the entire country. So I think that's something that we need to know to be aware of. Uh, and we are uh, arranging for um, uh, the uh, dental to be described, discussed as an item at the quality subcommittee in the near future so we can understand the state of the services that we've inherited from um, NHS England's commissioning. And then the second item, uh, which, which in fact took place yesterday, is that the primary care what is called contracting committee is becoming the commissioning committee, and that's going to be chaired by Debbie. Uh, it will be held in public, um, and we had a very helpful development day yesterday um, to take view on how we can do that and would anticipate uh, the next, the first meeting of that group to be in the next four or five weeks. Thank you. David, thank you for taking the sign, David. Any points for David Roy? <laughs> just sorry, to, 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 sorry, Roy, please. Can I just ask everybody to keep their voices raised when we make any contributions, please, so that everybody can. Thank you. Thank you, David. Just a comment to, about the dental position, thank you, Kurt, Chairman. Uh, there was an item actually on the news this morning on BBC News, quite a, quite a long item about about dental access, and it was saying that so ninety percent of NHS ninety percent of patients now cannot access NHS services in, in, in dental uh, services, which is really frightening and an extreme, quite quite frankly. Um, and it's all about the dental contract, as we know, I think, uh, which has been discussed now for. Well, I think a number of years, as we all know, and there was a report last week to uh, one of the committees in Parliament about that, um, and there were promises coming forward about the dental con contract being um, resolved, um, but I think that's come before Parliament before, and we're still in the same position. So we're in a difficult position, I think, with regards to um, units of dental activity, as they are, as they're known. So, um, but it, it's, it's really worrying when you see people who are saying uh, on the article this morning on the news that they are now work, well they're trying to, their own remedies really to, to affect their dental problems and uh, <coughs> that's oh, as far remedies. as I would, I would expect yeah. <laughs> pulling, their pulling their own teeth out <laughs> things like that yeah I mean, I didn't go to go that far, actually. You, you, you explained it much better than I would have, I would have dared to. But, I, 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 you know, when, you, when you're hearing that, and, of course, it's the communities uh, who are more deprived, who, who can't access these services and are, are, result, are resolving to these particular, um, particular harsh sort of remedies to, to try and resolve those, those, those um, dental problems that they've got. So... I'm pleased to hear that we're coming forward with something to the Quality Committee, David, uh, and we'd have a further and a longer discussion about that. But I think it would be remiss of us not to comment on it today, uh, given the um, interest in it that we're hearing in the media about dental issues. Uh, and I know dental practices, as David sort of alluded to, are, are closing as well uh, at, a, at a rate. And I've seen two actually that were just closed very, very recently. Um, so it's access to services, uh, Chairman, that I think uh, we need to have a discussion on. Uh, we'll come back with a broader and deeper discussion. Yeah, thank you. Two points. And Sarah, please. Yeah, I just wanted to triangulate that further. So I review all of the complaints that <coughs> come to the ICB, and I would say access to dental is up there in the top three. And we particularly get letters from MPs around access to dental, so I think a lot of constituents go to their MP and then 
they write, and my recollection is that it's predominantly, I'm not saying it's the only area of challenge, we can get a lot of complaints around Cumbria. So I don't think it's just deprivation, I think there might be challenges in our rural areas in terms of Dental and Preston from a complaints point of view. So I'll make sure when we do the quality committee item that we do a review of the complaints coming in and feedback in as part of that discussion. But I know a couple of our members of Parliament write regularly to Kevin around access to dental. Thank you. And as we take, David, as we take this commission responsibility on, which you mentioned last time, are we, is it a smooth transition from previous arrangements to ours? We've got full information of coverage and contracts yes, and we, so on. So uh, we've been fortunate enough that some of the regional uh, commissioning team have moved to join us in the oh. ICB um, and we've had a, a, a proper handover but in doing so um, the reason it's coming to quality committee is because we need to have full sight and do, do due diligence about what we will inherit here. Okay, thank you all. Good, let's move on. Community Health Services Transformation. Thank you, Chair. So I'm going to start. James and I pulled the paper together, um, together, so he might want to comment as well. And I also wanted to acknowledge um, the paper's been in development for a while and we've had lots of input. So I also particularly wanted to acknowledge the input from uh, the Director of Health and Care Integration for Blackburn and Darwin and also um, the SRO for the Provider Collaborative for Community Services who, through lots of discussions, have helped shape a lot of the thinking that's gone into this paper. So I won't go through the whole paper, we can take questions, but some of the key points I wanted to make. Um, it, I think it's often quoted that primary care is the bedrock of the NHS. I think it's a combination of community services and primary care that really are the bedrock of, of the NHS services for our communities. And there are really important conduit community services between the specialist and the generalist, between the acute sector and the primary care sector. So our vision, um, which Kevin's articulated a few times in us, in the, particularly in the state of the nation, our, our vision and ambition to have world-class community-centric um, community services is key. I think this piece of work and the other interrelated transformation pieces of work linked to this are absolutely going to be um, pivotal to both recovery transformation and then more importantly to truly um, developing better outcomes and better population for our local communities. So it's really important that we get this transformation right. And it's interesting, one of the things I was going to talk about and what the paper tries to present that I think the patient story and the subsequent discussion around um, both the memory service and the continent service is something the paper was trying to bring out. One of our challenges with this piece of work and share a bit more detail on this in part two is that we're starting from a base of really significant variation in commissioning across Lancashire and South Cumbria. So it's not just that the contracts in terms of the level of resource that's gone in varies, it's the service specification so it's really Chris couldn't have articulated better. In one area the memory clinic is done in a one-stop shop and patients can access A, B, C, D. In another area, they can only access maybe A of that level of service. So we have a lot of unwarranted variation just because of the way historical commission, and that's not meant to be critical. I think that was one of the challenges of small commissioning groups who rightly focused on their local population but didn't have the eye on the total population of Lancashire and South Cumbria. And it's a real, going to be a real challenge this for us because we want delivery rightly to be in place, making integrated teams work has to be placed and on all that relationship and coordination of care that very strongly came out in the patient story is for me about frontline teams and partners in place doing the right thing for the resident or the patient in front of them but as the commissioning organization for the system what we need to establish is some core principles that run through all of our services as they're commissioned and some core outcomes so that we don't get unwanted variation, so that it isn't about where you live, whether you access the gold standard service or the substandard service. We should be commissioning um, high level services right across, but then there might be some variance in how you deliver them and how you work together locally, dependent on the needs of the local population. So that's, that's the aim of the work. What the paper does is it, it, it lays out some of that variation it then suggests that we need to do this work. There'll be two kind of interrelated projects running simultaneously. One is that baseline mapping. We need to start, and we have started this work. We need to start by really understanding what we currently have in terms of the service specifications, the clinical models, 
the level of resource that's gone into these services across the patch. That may then need some business cases to come through either subcommittees or back to the board in terms of how we try and resource community services across the whole of the patch adequately. Um, and that baselining will then help influence what we need to do to, because what we need to do is make sure that each of the four place-based partnerships are adequately resourced in terms of community services so that the two we can work in partnership with social care, voluntary sector, and more importantly, families. There is an immediate piece of work that the paper is asking you to uh, approve, which is we've already got, back when we Darwin, there's already been some transaction last year, but that has left the services between LSCFT and East Lancaster Teaching Hospitals a little bit more fragmented, but there's a real willingness there to align those contracts and to do a quick transaction that will allow Blackburn with Darwin to really start then to do the place-based work that needs to be done around integrated neighbourhood teams. So we're asking the board to approve a transaction between um, Blanks and LSCFT and East Lancs Teaching Hospitals. And then the paper also, building on what Kevin said earlier, we also recognise, so we've already got um, integration between the acute trusts and the community services in Morecambe Bay and Blackpool Teaching Hospitals. There may be further work that needs to happen there when we've done the baselining, but they work reasonably well at the moment. I'm sure there will be other work to be done and the place-based partnerships will be doing um, work, but we know that Central and West are probably our two areas. So Central and West are one place in our new configuration <coughs> places where we really need to have a real transformation approach to how do we move towards um, both the vertical integration of community services between the acute and community providers and then our place as integrated neighbourhood teams, that horizontal working across. And there's already strong commitment from both Chris and Kevin to be part of that transformation work through a partnership board in this next few months while we really um, scope out any further changes we may need to do contractually or commissioning wise to make those services really work. So that's, that's the essence of this programme. The other key point I would um, like to make, and probably would expect this from me, given that I think 99% of community services are delivered by nurses and allied health professionals, we're trying to make sure that this work is absolutely clinically led, um, not just in terms of myself and um, the Director of Health and Care Integration for South Cumbria, but we've already got, um, I already meet regularly with representatives from community nursing and allied health professionals every month, and that will become the underpinning clinical reference group to drive this programme of work so that we really are listening to our frontline teams and running alongside that we will make sure there's really strong um, patient and carer reference groups that are driving this work we will listen to the experiences of patients and carers like Sue that we heard before to make sure that as we develop these services um, we're, we're listening to the experience of frontline staff and patients and carers. I'll finish there, Chair, I James. Thank you, so yeah, just to um, from a, a this is this is one of four major community and um, private care transformation programs that we've now now fully established, and um, they they're going to report into a community and primary uh, care services transformation board, which meets for the first time next month. I've got the pleasure of, of chairing that, and uh, we've got place lead now for each of those four that are, that, that are taking the. Um, Executively working closely with Sarah said with ICB SROs and, um, P and, and, and SROs from the PCP. So we are uh, we're going to really motor now with this. This is a, a key part of our transformation, and we're, we're starting to set ourselves really clear targets. As Sarah's just outlined here, um, the, the only other point that I'll make is that the, um, the this links fundamentally to our workforce transformation strategy as well. Um, so so uh, uh, which we're framing from a community perspective in terms of integration with local authority, integrated roles, um, integrated career structures, um, and um, integrated employment models, so that, 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 that they, um, they come together. So we'll be bringing further updates from the Transformation Board as it meets, um, and each of the, uh, the other three programmes will start to come forward to future board meetings with the substantive updates from progress. Thank you, James. Hit me, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sarah. And, uh, James, very well paper, um, and absolutely right ambition in terms of kind of resetting the system. Um, I think there's no doubt the ambition has been around for about 30 years at least. Uh, certainly 20 years ago when I was at PCT, it's really clear that 
the way to deal with best best pension outcomes is to make sure you've got the appropriate community structures to prevent the appropriate patients into secondary tertiary care. The challenge is being we've never managed to deliver to that issue because there is a real degree of double running we've got to do for a period of time. I think is whilst you're dealing with the amount of acute care, and that's taken up all your resources, you've got to start to build the capacity in primary care for community services. So I think those investment decisions that you bring into us will be really, really helpful. Um, but there will be a real key part of this board to then make sure that we do put the right resources in place to start to help with that kind of Otherwise, the risk is five years from now, the other people sitting on this table having the same discussions as we're having. Yeah. Sheena, Jim, Roy, Tracy, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, um, really welcome this piece of work. I think it's absolutely key to <coughs> ensuring that um, meeting the needs of people much more effectively. Um, this is absolutely bedrock. Just really pleased to hear uh, Sarah talk about the fact that we're looking at vertical as well as horizontal integration. I think the real difference will be when we get that absolutely embedded in terms of the work into the integrated neighbourhood teams and thinking very differently about communities, about where people live their lives and the whole kind of um, getting alongside, meeting more, more effectively first of all, but also changing that need. So I think just seeing that together I think is really important um, and um, I think it's really key that we continue to work in that way that we kind of bring those those things together um, and um, do it in that way. My final point I just wanted to mention was I know this is about adult services and I think we just need to make sure we don't lose the whole children's integrated care bit and what does that mean also for the way that we work together about um, uh, the way that we meet the need of children and young people in that holistic, integrated way in the community. So I think we just need to just make sure that we don't lose that in our work going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. To Jim, if we can all keep our voices up as well, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, three comments, really. The, the first is, again, about horizontal and vertical integration. And we're, we're going down the vertical integration line. And I've had arguments in the past when I was a trustee of executive about which was right. And I don't think there is a right way. There's not a right or wrong way. But it feels like we need to put safeguards in place. So we, we shouldn't just go down this vertical integration without making sure that we've we, we still got um, appropriate range across the horizontal um, these places. And I'm not quite sure how we do that. So, but but it, that needs to be built into this somehow. I think it, it talks about the vision. But the vision is just an aspiration, one. and that vision needs really fleshing out, I think. And I know you're going to be working on this. So it's a really important piece of work, and we, it's, we are where we are, and we've got to take it forward from here. But I don't think the board can necessarily sign up to a blank check on this. So I, I don't know what the feedback process is going to be, and I'm sure Sarah or James will explain that to us in a minute. But it, it feels like as we move forward, as we flesh out the vision, we need to be making sure we're on, on board with that. Sarah's rightly talked about um, standardisation at a number of meetings in the past, and today about core principles and systems, and I completely agree with that, but we need to understand what they are, I think, and that, that fleshes out the vision. And the final point is, around the project management, this is a big piece of work. It feels like it needs senior finance and or commissioning people around the table on that. So um, it's got to be grounded in reality as well as for it for, to progress. The reason why it's not progressed for 30 years is, is partly because it's never been fully grounded in reality, that there's kind of people get aspirational and then don't take it forward. And community services traditionally has been used as a means of subsidising other services. And that needs to not be the case. We need to invest fully in community services. Thank you. I'll collect all the points and um, come back to you guys at the end. Is that okay? <coughs> We're now Roy Dan Tracy, please. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, very much welcome the report and, uh, and definitely the, the, the baseline assessment um, we talked about briefly, I think, in, in, in uh, IAP, the about the integrated care strategy and about doing some baseline work on that as well. So I think, uh, you know, joining those two things together would be, would be really helpful. I'm just going to touch on something, Chairman, that's not actually in the report, but I've just, it's, and I think it alludes to it, and it's, it's about the Lancashire patient record system. 
And we did some work on that. There used to be a digital health board, and uh, it was shared by Sapti, actually, uh, the uh, public health director from Lancashire. Uh, and we did some work on the Lancashire patient record system, obviously, that's, that's held by each of the acute trusts. And if we want a truly integrated service, I think, across the whole of the whole of our system, our IC, ICS, ICB system, then we need to ensure that that patient record system is up to date and it's available, I think, to all of the areas within our, within our system. So it's not in the report, Jim, but I think it, I think it is part of yeah. this uh, part of the question. Thank you, Roy. So, uh, Tracy, next, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, like others have said, I really welcome this report. Um, I do think there are a lot of challenges within it in terms of how it can be delivered, but the ambition is definitely there. A couple of things from me. Um, I think acknowledgement of the role of the voluntary sector within community health services is lacking, if I'm honest. And I think things that maybe often aren't thought about when we think about community health services, so the, the work of social enterprises in delivering community health services, hospices as well in particular, and then all the outreach work that, that takes place across the community that's often delivered by the voluntary sector. I think the acknowledgement that resources are squeezed within the report in terms of the kind of competition between acute and community health services is very much there. But again, I think understanding sometimes how the gaps at a community level are filled by the voluntary sector and how we really understand and capture what's happening on the ground because, as, as Jim said, it, we're not going to transform things until we really understand the picture, where the resources are going and where they need to go for the future. So I think there's other work that's happening behind the scenes in looking at mapping out where a lot of resources are going into the voluntary sector that's really crucial to take this kind of work forward. I think also the, the recognition that when services are squeezed and services pop up, often it isn't just about filling a gap, it's often about the fact that people are not accessing statutory NHS community health services, but they will access services in the voluntary sector. And again, that talks to the point that Asim made about people uh, maybe not getting an early diagnosis from certain communities because of the whole range of stigma that exists in terms of accessing statutory services. So I think, again, a real kind of <coughs> emphasis on where we put services, who's delivering them, and how we make sure that nobody's really being left behind. And that is, again, something that I think we as a sector have a role to play in that. Thanks, Tracy. We hope we've got David and Kevin. Thanks, uh, Sarah. I just, um, I mean, obviously, uh, this is a major, pro a major transformation program, and I think we're going to see several of those coming over the next few, few months and, and, and onwards. And I guess I was left after reading the report just thinking, um, we need, we need to really understand exactly how we're going to listen to the community. And, and you know, there's a, there's a point in here, point three, point ten, that describes it, but it's a very minor point in a, in a very far-reaching report and I guess when we do this I'd really appreciate just understand a little bit more detail about how are we actually going to make that happen, how are we really going to listen to our communities, take them with us, empower them. Um, so yeah, so I don't know if you can provide any more assurance about how we might do that and how that might be supported. Do you want to do it? I don't mind, do you want to do it all yes. at the end? Or do yeah, do it at the end. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks David. Uh, Kevin and Jeff. Yeah, thanks David. I mean having um, set up and run many of the community services in East Lancashire. The, the resilience of that system is because of that integrated system that's been developed. And I think the work that Chris is now doing with Martin <coughs> and Hodgson to transfer DVP services, so you've got holistic services in East Lancashire, is absolutely to be commended because you will get that resilience <coughs> and that investment that Hibby talked about has happened in East Lancashire over many, many years. If I compare and contrast that then with central Lancashire, the fragility of the service is that we don't have those integrated services and we haven't had that inter integration and that investment over many years. So I really welcome the recommendation that's in here in terms of setting up that board to really focus on both the integration, both, <coughs> both um, vertical and horizontal, and it's the right thing to do. I suppose my only nervousness is that another year, you know, we've, we've got to do the work and it's another year further on, so it's another year in which we're going to have to manage that capacity and that lack of capacity in central Lancashire. So really supportive, but nervous that we need to keep, keep this going and make sure we deliver it as quickly as possible. Thank you. 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 Th
Thanks, Kevin. We've got Jeff, Ben, and G. That's now. Thanks, Jeff. So I absolutely agree with Sarah that it's not just about GPs and primary care, that community services are, you know, and, and without that, we're nothing. Without good community services, that's been our problem in primary care. It's a bit like having a cardiothoracic surgery without an intensive care unit. So you, you, we do absolutely cry out for these improved community services. Um, but I, th I think we have to remember, as we're heading towards integrated neighbourhood teams, there are other people we don't commission in the ICB, but are equally important, like care uh, and, and, and for the BCFSE. So, so, so I'm sure we haven't forgotten that, but I just wanted to make that point. That's really critical when we're, when we're developing this. Um, I hope while we've got some concerns, <coughs> I hope while we are standardising and finding the gaps and filling them, that we don't dumb down, that we keep what's good, because there are areas of excellence and good practice. And, 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 and that can happen inadvertently, and I think we need to keep an eye on that. I'll, I'll voice a concern, Kevin, that is often said in, 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 in people like myself out in communities, um, uh, that bud the budget for community services held by trusts are at risk. Um, I don't believe that necessarily, Absolutely. but, I, but it, yeah, we need to be clear that that is often a concern in the public and in the clinical community. That, that, um, that we need to see, though, we want to see investment in community service increase, not de decrease, don't we? Uh, we? We all know that's the right thing to do, uh, heading towards the, the strategy that we have. Um, so I'll just voice that. Um, Section 310 mentions the involvement of communities and clinic, uh, uh, place directors, but I think if places are going to be represented in, in the engagement, it's more than just the director, it's got to be clinicians on the ground from primary care, from community services, because they've got a richness of knowledge uh, and experience to contribute to this. So that's really important. Um, and the other thing I wasn't clear about, but I probably missed it, is I wasn't sure if this was about mental health community services as well, or whether it's just physical health services. So I just wanted some clarity on that, because that's obviously a really key thing that we need support in primary care. Um, overall, I think it's a really good good transformation programme, uh, but one with risks. And I, I, I wonder what the plan is for oversight back here at the board in stages so that we can see how things are going and, and, and if there are things that we don't like or do, or do like, etc. So, so yeah. overall, a big thumbs up, but just some concerns. Thank you, Jo. And to Angie, please. Thank you. So, again, really welcome the report. Um, I think this is really important. <coughs> And kind of three points that I wanted to, to raise, some of which have been flagged already. One is about the ambit, one is about geography, and the other is about costs and trade-offs later on. Um, so, so first of all, I was, um, I, I think it's starting to become a little bit clearer through the dialogue, but I was interested in the ambit of this um, work because it doesn't mention things like dentistry or ophthalmology that are rife in the community. It didn't mention the BCFS or the care services. And indeed, Sarah, you referred to 90% of this being delivered by nurses. So if we really want to transform, have we got the right ambit for this would be my challenge. Um, and then for us, there's a question about the trade-off in ter terms of timing, perhaps, because clearly we're solving some immediate problems which need to be addressed. Um, but are we actually preventing transformation or are we actually creating the environment where that re real transformation of communities can take place? So that's kind of question one. Question two is about <coughs> geographies. Um, again, we seem to be talking about slightly different geographies in different places. And like the last board where we had sort of three goes at strategies, all of which had slightly different nuanced priorities, I'm getting a sense of slightly different nuanced geographies coming up in different pieces of work. So what are the real geographies that we're looking at and working to here? And are we being consistent? And we'll probably pick that up again when we get to the fuller report. So that's something I think we need to think about. And then finally, obviously the work will need to come back here to the board to consider. We do have to live within a cost envelope and um, chair and chief exec are very good at reminding us of that um, so if we do want to make that investment we need to be very conscious of the trade-offs which are probably going to be between the acutes and the community 
and we need to be really clear about the value of the money and how we make those trade-offs and what the consequences are. So there were the three points. Very helpful. Made. Thank you, Angie. Sam? Thank you. So, you know, like everybody else, really support this, this direction. I think just as a principle, coming back to Jim's point earlier, I think the conversation we've had as an exact team really is in all of our transformation programs, whatever they are, we have to have a really strong um, finance, procurement and contracting support into them and, and I'm sure James and Sarah will be able to talk about that, but that's got to be a given. I think in particular there's, there's, there's two big reasons we, we absolutely need that in this case and, and one is as well as making sure that this is the best in terms of in terms of the best outcome for patients, which is that the other test is the value for money. So we need to make sure this isn't just about investing extra resources into community. This is about how do we make it work across the system? What, how, we, how is this affordable and sustainable? And I think we, we, we also you know, just need to make sure that um, it's, it's got proper procurement and contracting around it. And that's, that's, that's going to be absolutely key with, with all, all of these programs. And, um, I suppose they're, they're the key things, really. I just wanted to make sure that we're getting that value for money and that we're testing that properly through this process. But there is, has been that conversation in the exec team, which, which has sort of made sure that, as a principle, this is feeding into all of our, all of our transformation programmes. One of the things that we will need as a system, because this will be about how we move things around the system, because the second point really is that it could potentially be a barrier if we don't do this, is we need a risk gain share agreement between organisations to do this, because what you could very easily do is by moving things around is to stabilise individual organisations. So that's going to be a really important part of the work we do from a finance perspective. All help. Back to me, I'll try and, uh, if I miss any, please, um, if, you know, I'll transfer them all down. I think the first thing I, I jotted down to respond to was, was Ibi's point about 20 to 30 years, I'd actually had that, I meant to make that point, you know, for as long as I can remember there's been this ambition to move more work into the community, so I, I think it's a really valid point. I don't fully, um, I think you can do some of this without double running, I, I, you know, I've had experience where some of this isn't just about, and picking up on the money, isn't always just about new resource, some of this is about working differently and getting frontline teams to work differently, and I, and I think one of the real strengths in Lancashire and South Cumbria is we have um, an area in linked to East Lancs Trust and, and that Pennine where we've got had a very success at this that we can build on. But also there's a number of people sat around this table who in different roles in different areas have also had success at delivering um, community services that have been vertically and horizontally integrated and, and, have, and have got proven success in doing that. So I think we can build on our understanding of that and our knowledge and use the expertise around this table and across some of our teams to to do to, to make this ambition a reality and determine that we can do this and I think we can do some of it without double running. Um, I think actually responding to she Sheena's point, when we started this and I was drafting the paper it was only I think we're going to have to include children. I had a very helpful discussion with some of Chris's team last week about children so it might not be fully included but I also chair the systems children and young persons board it's meeting this afternoon and there is some relevant work going on alongside this around children's community services and we can connect the two but I don't think we can depending on some of the outcomes of some of this work I don't think we'll be able to fully exclude children's but we absolutely won't lose sight of children's responding to the other question this isn't mental health at this stage but so much of this is interlinked so even though it's not about transforming community mental health services you know the horizontal integration at place is about physical health services working in an integrated way with community mental health services so we can't ignore it, but at this point, the transformation work is, is focusing on physical health services. I, I absolutely agree, I can't remember who made this point, that it is about vertical and horizontal integration. And there was a really helpful um, publication a few years ago, to pre, pre the legislation, um, that on um, the complex systems are a combination of vertical and horizontal integration. So I don't think the answer here is one or the other. It's how we get these teams to work both in the vertical way into acute trust, but absolutely pivotal at place, wrapped around primary care and social care, working together. So we will look at both of those. In terms, and, and I absolutely agree, the points about the vision needs work, the infrastructure, really this is the starting point. We needed, we needed to get board's endorsement today for the general direction of travel and how the program's gonna work. We have got a steering group drafted, we have got potential dates, but clearly, didn't want to launch that and go ahead until we've had board's endorsement today. We will absolutely make sure, and James might want to come in about the overarching infrastructure, but absolutely there will be a specific steering group for this piece of work. It will have finance, BI, PMO all wrapped around it, commissioning expertise as well as clinical expertise. 
and, and clearly um, James could talk about that overarching transformation program board will periodically need to be feeding back to the board so that that oversight is there. So we will absolutely make sure all that happens. In terms of the um, patient record, again, in my experience, we won't make any of this work without shared care records and the joining up of digital. So, and Asim might want to comment on that. Asim and I, the, the ability is there in the system. So a lot of this is about how we launch this, how we make sure that our front line, te front line teams are digitally connected and are using that same shared care records so that will be part of it. Um, I apologise that it wasn't strong enough on the voluntary sector. That isn't an intention or an oversight. The mapping we've already started, we are also mapping already what we know the voluntary sector do across the patch. So we're not just looking at NHS services here, we are looking at all NHS commission services, including the voluntary sector. So I'll speak to you, Tracy, about how we make sure the intention is there that yourself and the sector are pivotal in this work and are contributing to it, the right people are on the steering group. And similarly, um, I can't probably give you detail about how we do the engagement yet, David, but again, you know, we would, we would come to you, Jane and I, to talk about how can Health Watch and wider um, Debbie and yourselves help us make sure we get that engagement right. So all of that still needs working up, but it's absolutely there, the intent to do that and to figure out how we engage in a meaningful way is all there in the paper and we, I'm happy to pick that up with you about how we do that um, using your expertise. I've answered the mental health of adult. I think that David might want to add here, Angie, I think the and, particularly dentistry and pharmacy, is probably part of the fuller work, but it all connects and that's why there's an overarching, trans there's four transformation programmes, this is one, integrated neighbourhood teams, which is the fuller work, is another one, there's an intermediate care work stream and there's a care sector work stream. So there's four interrelated transformation pieces of work that will feed into the transformation programme board for this. So I think some of that, this piece of work is really about making sure the community services are fit for purpose at place to do that integrated working with the AND. Um, but happy to take other views on that. <coughs> geography, I don't know if I'm, I mean, I think for me, the geography is about our four place-based partnerships, which is what we committed to so from my point of view in the geography it's about working really really closely with South Cumbria, Blackpool, Blackburn with Darwin and then Lancashire but of course Lancashire is com as complicated by the three sub places that I know Louise is kind of thinking about so that's how I see the geography working but happy Kevin might want to comment on that. Um, I think I've touched on governance and time so I think they were all the main queries yeah, well that, that I just did. Very good <laughs> Um, re really, I'll just pick up on two points. So it's done a great job in, in responding to those. Um, the, the, the point's been well made that we recognise we need to really power this up, Jim, and particularly to your point. Um, it hasn't been done before for a whole host of reasons. Undoubtedly, one of those is also that there hasn't been enough a, a focused resource, the right resource, the right combination of people, partners around this. So we recognise um, that this has got to be powered up. In fact, Sam and I were having a conversation about this only only um, yesterday afternoon. So we are in the process at the moment of, of working that through in terms of what we need to do with this and working with the places <coughs> on that. So we will we will be powering all four of these programmes, all four of the community and primary care transformation programmes. In terms of governance, we have got the first board meeting set up for next month, as Sarah's mentioned. Um, so we will be able to we will be bringing regular formal reporting into this board for that. As, long, as well at an overall level, as well as some focused deep dives into each of the programmes in subsequent um, and upcoming board meetings. So we'll be, we'll be pulling you all in at different points as well to, um, uh, to, 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 to draw an expertise and experience. Um, there are plans already in place, and these are going to get more and more detailed as Sarah describes as we go through the baseline, and we've got bits now for all four of these programmes. These are going to be approved at the, the first board meeting next month. So we are starting to move on this and we're going to pick up pace increasingly because these, these really are priority for us. Kevin. Yeah, look, uh, really good discussion, uh, everyone. I think it's a really significant uh, decision for the board. Um, I guess if you were an optimist, you would say we have a rich tapestry of, uh, of services that we've inherited. If you're a pessimist, you'd say it's a bit messy. Um, just to put that in perspective, you're probably assuming we've got five or six approaches around the hospitals and that. The reality is we've probably got close to 100 community services 
contracts here, and actually quite a lot of them are with the market sector already, um, but they're very, very fragmented. They're also very short term. There are very few that extend beyond a year, actually. Um, and as Sarah covered at, at the introduction, different service levels, different resourcing levels. So the baselining is really important here to, to shine a light on all of that and, and, and sort of get our head around it. And therefore, it means this is not going to be a quick fix. This is not simply saying we're going to move to you know, four place-based arrangements and it's all going to be fine and dandy. There's probably four or five years of hard graft here to really um, to get this right. And that's why I think the style here is right, and this is something we need to do in other areas. Set the broad direction of travel, start to do things on the ground, innovate, pilot, and, and, and keep coming back to the board and, and you know being a bit pragmatic about it. Otherwise, it'll take forever to do so. That style is really important. I think we've also had a really good discussion around the sort of hard and the soft. There are some configuration issues here around the vertical and the horizontal, but what's really stood out for me, particularly around the East Pennines, it, it, it's the culture, and it's the clinician culture that really makes a difference. They don't see community service as a second class option. In fact, they see it as the preferred option. And that's the thing that really makes a difference. Here. So I think we've got to really focus on, on those on those people issues. And I think we also need to look at it in that wider context. Um, and that discussion between Sarah and Angie, I think, is important. This is actually only a small part of the wider community services uh, offer. <clears throat> and again, if you look at the East Lanks success, the other thing that struck me is they've got the right culture there, they've got high levels of investment, and they've also got a lot of the right infrastructure there. I mean, they're an exemplar on virtual wards. They've got the, the, the community, the, the intermediate care uh, provision is best there, etc. It's all of these things that come together uh, to, to make um, the whole better than some of its parts of the United States. This is a really important step. But it's actually the beginning of what I'm doing. Very good summary, thank you. Look, I have um, a number of people around this table like me who've been around the block a few times, and, and the, the more initiatives, either at national or local level, and more papers and more documents written called Transforming Community Services, then you can shake a sticker, uh, which illustrates it is very difficult. The thing that I think is different for us this time is this. Uh, so we're all in the room collectively together. When we've had discussions about some of this in the past, um, Tracy and the voluntary sector generally would have been outside the room looking in at what was happening. Angie and the women colleagues would have been outside the room. Here they go again. Another, another, another go at changing community services. And internally in the health service we've been we've over agonized about this vertical or horizontal integration. And in the thought bubbles above people's heads in those discussions has always been pound signs. So we're going to make a bit of money out of this. Now so I think there's lots of lessons we can learn from the past. The, the one bit that I don't think we've touched on in, in the discussion on this is that there are all our staff working in community out there. If they listen to this discussion, say, here they go again. We'll just carry on with our, here they go again, we'll just carry on with our jobs. Thanks very much, we've seen and heard it before. And the way in which the staff, whether they're NHS staff or working as other part of providers are involved in this process, is vitally important. Let's have the discussion without, and then find a resource solution that's equitable, fair, and transparent afterwards, rather than it become part of the negotiation. No. But this is so important, Kevin, to the strategy documents and the plans that we discussed at the last meeting. That I welcome the paper. We certainly note the challenges, we note the projects. All right. We can approve the East Lancashire LSCFT. Good. Thank you. I look forward.
forward to the ongoing discussion. Well done. So, well done, Joe. Nice that leads us into the implementation of the full up stop tape. We remember the first discussion very clearly from our first meeting tonight. Okay, just pinch my first line. Okay, yes, indeed. Thank you. So, um, this is an update on the work that's been undertaken to across the ICB about implementing the Fuller report. And this is about uh, creating out-of-hospital services which are much more proactive, um, providing patients with personalised care. And it comes from, as Sarah's described, that multidisciplinary team. Okay, and I'll, I'll expand on that in a moment. Uh, we did have a report back in, in July of last year, our first uh, formal board meeting. Um, and, and there's two elements to this, this paper. First of all, there's the development journey, and then there's the so what. So the first bit, the development journey, there's been a, a, a number of workshops that have taken place across uh, Langston South Cumber with, um, with primary care teams to, to look at the uh, the fuller report, of which there are about seven elements, as you can see in 2.2, but to describe how can we um, have a, a delivery framework for the primary care networks. And, and we've done that work to develop kind of um, what the steps are to get to good, uh, both at neighbourhood place and system. Uh, and in fact, the national team have been very interested in this uh, because we seem to be slightly ahead of some of the rest of the country. Um, the proposal is that all of the PCNs would actually undertake a self-assessment and develop a delivery plan, um, ideally by the end of June of this year. Um, but very much the delivery of the integrated care plans <coughs> uh, will be take place at place. Um, and then as, very much as, alluded, as Sarah and James has alluded to, this work would form part of the uh, wider community Sorry, transforming community care program. Okay, so there we are. It's, it's all in one place. 3.4 is, is a really key um, diagram because it does describe what an integrated neighborhood team looks like. Um, and it's not just primary care. It is about community services. It's about social care. It's about that population health and well-being and prevention. And critically, at the top of that, there's that neighbourhood and community. And that really does mean the voluntary sector, the faith groups, uh, as, as we've discussed previously. And it's about them all coming together. Uh, and, what, and that's worked very well. And I'm sure Jeff, at one point, well, when he comes back with his comments, will say, well, in Barrow, because this is what's happened in Barrow, and I've been to see it. Um, so it is about the, that coming together, that knowledge about who's doing what and who can offer what to provide that proactive care to patients. In, in 3.7, it talks about the phasing, and we've been asked through the full report to focus on our most deprived areas. We've got lots of those. Um, but you can see three, in 3.7, the ambition is that we would start uh, building these integrated neighbourhood teams from September of this year. Um, starting in those most deprived areas, but recognising some may want to go a bit quicker, and that's not a problem at all. Um, importantly, and Angie, you will have seen this, we will need to be working with this as a local authority and our colleagues on this as well. So, what does this mean for, for patients? So the first thing is, is this take frailty? And frailty is a very broad word in many respects. It means lots of different things to different people. It could mean that dementia patient heard about earlier today, for example. And the intention is, is that as, as, we, as we take this forward, that within those neighbourhood teams, they would um, be identifying those patients with frailty. They would be assessed, there would be a score, and most importantly, there would be a proactive care plan for them. So how can we manage these patients to ensure that they don't end up in the hospital? that we do manage them in the community where possible with that multidisciplinary team where possible, supporting them. Um, and you can see in chart one, there's a lot of variation at present amongst the number of patients who actually have a care plan or not. So there's an ambition to improve that so at least 50% of patients have an updated score and care plan um, 
by March 24. That doesn't sound very ambitious to start with, but the numbers are huge, by the way, because I did go back and query that. There are a large number of patients in general practice um, who, um, who, who are thought to be frail. The second important area I want to describe is the priority wards. Uh, and this is a concept that um, if we go into our communities, you will find there are streets within those communities that have high volumes of patients going into the hospital, okay? And you could go a few streets away and, it, and it's not there. And it is because that is where the deprivation and other features of health and social care and housing and employment all come together to bring the worst possible outcome. And those are the groups we need to start focusing on. Uh, and certainly the intention is, is to start identifying some of those priority wards within those um, integrated neighbourhood teams and work, and it, it, again, it's that big picture of those teams coming to, together to understand what can we do to reduce the number of admissions by supporting these groups. It's going to be different for each of those few streets, okay? Because the, the, uh, the, the issues will be different, the solutions will be different. So that's the second piece of work that we've done, and the intention is um, to do so to try and reduce the number of patients uh, ending up coming to you know, the emergency departments. And of course, the vital work in the voluntary community sector with that. Um, and then finally, is, is doing enhanced um, health checks. Uh, the fact is, we do health checks, and in, in, you, some of you will have been invited to a health check. If you go along to your GP and have your health check done. We need to do that differently. Um, we need to be doing it um, in the mosques. We need to do it in community centres. We need to go to the warm spaces. We need to go to different places to target those who probably are more vulnerable um, so that we can actually ensure that we're doing those health checks uh, and dealing with those, those patients who are probably more likely to be that need those, some interventions. Uh, I've talked about working effectively with patient, people in communities. That's going to be vital uh, to this piece of work. And finally, um, within population health and prevention, we have had a development program for some of our leaders of the primary care networks. This has gone on for the last 12 months to help them understand health, equality, health inequalities and how to tackle them. This is now being evaluated by a King's Fund um, because it's attracted a lot of interest as well. So. There's the update uh, and, and the plans for the, the phased implementation. Uh, I'm very happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you. Good paper. Dave. Uh, oh. Debbie Tracy, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. I thought it was a really helpful paper and I particularly recommend, um, particularly value the approach that you're taking to try and get. Um, an approach that flexes within the neighbourhood and the community and even the street, because that's absolutely right, but gets that consistency across. So I guess my, my sort of question is how, how will we achieve that? I can see how in the paper you've given a really strong sense of how we'll get down to neighbourhood level, get down to street level, make sure that what's they achieves our impact, but how are we going to surface some of that learning to make sure that we still have a consistent approach across and we can see as commissioners what we need to do by or learn from to enable us to sort of put a systematic approach in place to drive improvement. Do you want to hold on to the points, Dave? Tracy, Thank you. Thanks, David. Really good to see and good to hear you talk about the role of the BCFSE within integrated neighbourhood teams, but also that wider kind of work that's happening with priority wards. I just wanted to pick up on that and a couple of things that you said. Um, the, it's really welcome, this work, in terms of looking at where the deprivation is and really kind of shining the light on those communities or those um, micro-communities almost where, where there is real need um, for maybe a change of approach. I think one of the, the concerns I have and, and, and shared by colleagues across the wider sector is absolutely agree the direction of travel should be around community services delivering health checks, delivering things like blood pressure checks. And we, we, you know, we've talked at length about managing hypertension on that community level across um, primary care networks in Blackpool. I think one of the real concerns, and it kind of plays into what Debbie's saying about the, the sort of the way we take this forward is, 
Um, we have to look at the context around this, and the backdrop is that we're working um, in a, a situation where there's abject poverty in many of these communities. And if we start to highlight health problems, <coughs> the kind of next step and the so what for people is so important. And people um, obviously experience these conditions with a whole range of other social economic factors that play into affecting their health. And it's how we make sure that we don't raise people's expectations of what's possible by going in and delivering things like a blood pressure check only to find actually there aren't then the follow-up services. Um, and that could be health, but it could also be somebody who is out of work, they're suffering with hypertension because of the stress around debt and financial pressures. How do we then make sure that all of those services are connected up within that community, within that street, that, that ward, that area, so we don't raise expectations but also leave people without the support that they need. Sure. Thank you. Um, I don't disagree with any of the contents or the direction of travel. But I want to think of the governance issues, I guess. One is um, this essay was launched on the 19th of April, and it felt like it should come here first before it got launched. So, um, and it also says it's <coughs> like authority support. So, should it actually have been launched on the 19th of April? It may have been launched as a draft, but it, that's not what the wording says. And the other thing is, um, it's, it strikes me that we should have been talking about place before we are talking about the neighbourhood teams because there's an iterative exercise this and we're almost presenting place with a place of conflict here. I'm not 100% sure whether that matters or not, but if I was the place director and, I, and you, you told me how the neighbourhood teams are going to work, I might not be able to get happy about that um, because I'd be wanting to shape it presumably to my place. I know we want standardisation and a common approach, but it feels like we've... Um, potentially jump the gun in terms of improving this before we've had the conversation around <coughs> place and how places will function. Thank you. Uh, David Lerpe, this sequencing government thing to your first sponsors, but Asim, then Kevin, then Jeff. And, Jeff. and the comments I'll make here is equally relevant to the community services paper. So I think if you read the paper, there's a strong focus on digital data uh, and other I think he says that uh, this will not be able to flourish if you don't get the, the data sharing right. And not just data sharing for the sake of data sharing, but how do we use data to support that care planning across, across integrated neighbourhood teams. So uh, Roy mentioned the, the Lancashire Patient Record Exchange Service, um, which is now the Lancashire and South Cumbria Shared Care Record. So it, it also now includes our more conveyor partners. And it's one of the most used shared care record systems in the country, but it has massive variations. So some places are using it really adequately, some places are not. And, and they are used primarily to support or to avoid the patient retelling their story. It's not necessarily used for prevention, and I'll come on to some of that in a second. So we, we do need to recognise the maturity of our digital and data infrastructure across our system. We have two provider organisations, two providers that don't even have an electronic patient record system at this current currently. So they are really sort of uh, depending on their manual processes. We are putting that right. We've got a sort of ambition to have a single electronic patient record system across the queue. Similarly, we need a single electronic patient record system in our uh, community setting. So the digital data infrastructure needs to be really right. It's not just about sharing information, it's about how we use this information for prevention. So I've got some data in front of me that shows people with depression as their first primary long-term condition, or nearly half are going to have diabetes as well. So with that information, what are we going to use? How are we going to use that information to, to, to support prevention? And that will then really support that integrated neighborhood teams. So I think key messages are sort of how do we use that shared care record system, how we use that population health intelligence system as well, and we've got a lot of data around some of our communities, where we can pinpoint at ward level so the differences in long-term condition, frailty and death risk factors, but there's a, there's a need on educating people on how to use that data and then to re respond to, to that what, what they see in that data. Thank you, Ashley. Very, very good. Kevin. Thanks, David. I mean, this feels really positive, David. 
and um, really supportive of it. It feels like it's a piece of the jigsaw that we've got to get right, and it clearly links to the conversations we've just been having on community services and how we can get that integration. And I suppose the obvious comment from my perspective is that if we're really going to get integrated service delivery, we need to link the PCNs and the integrated networks into the acute hospitals as well, so we've got that link and we've got the, 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 the pathways uh, sorted. So it's really a plea, you know, to get in, can we get involved in the work and from the um, PCB support, any support you need, we'll provide this because if we can get this piece right, it will really help in terms of trying to take some of the pressure and the flow and it will off the acute trust and it will allow us to that investment in community and out of hospital care that we've been talking about this morning. So really support for this, but I'm pleased to be involved in the work and, and please, please get us involved. Thank you, Kevin. Chair. Thank you, Chair. So, I would say a big well done to David so far. It's been a massive piece of work done so far. So, just like the last paper, really welcome. Um, I'll, I'll say what I said at the first at the first board meeting, and that is when we discussed this. It doesn't answer all the problems in primary care. It, it goes a long way, but there are lots of other issues, some beyond our control. So, so um, you know, things like workforce workload, uh, provision of care and funding are massive issues for community and primary care services. Uh, so, so we may be able to influence those in part, but we have to recognise we are at the, the, the mercy of, of, of other, other agencies, um, and that's playing out in the national press at the moment, isn't it? So, so, so um, you know, criti critically, um, this, th this project will be a, this transformation will be a success um, if, if there are positive changes elsewhere. And, the, the, real, the real issue for me is, what's going to be the new model of care? <coughs> because we can't carry on doing what we do. So what do we do and what don't we do in the future, in each individual profession, or who else does what I do at the moment? That, that kind of conversation is going to be really critical. Um, I think the agenda, um, quite rightly, has to focus on health inequalities and population health issues such as frailty and dementia, really big issues that can be best dealt with at a neighbourhood level. So we need to support that and, and see big change. Uh, and, and, I think, and I think, as David suggested, I have seen this work back home. And you know, we, we, we've been working on this for several years. And where it works well, it works really well. And you bring about significant change. Um, and, and, and as Kevin said, where, where we did in Morecambe Bay work around respiratory care, the Morgan Bay Respiratory Network, we decimated referrals into secondary care. Absolutely, did, with better results, you know, so, so it, it does work, it can work, it, it's a very valid thing to pursue, but there are difficulties. Um, I, I, I've got a sense of a need for, there's been ICB-wide events involving lots of people, there's been lots of engagement, but I've got a sense that we need to go on the road a little bit and take that into places or, or subdivisions of places um, to, because I think we need to get maximum involvement and engagement of our local clinicians and, and other agencies because uh, that, that's where they will all talk together. So if we're going to make a success, we need to get everybody behind the strategy. Um, and I think, like Asim said, I think there's a bit, going to be a big call on digital and data and estates to support this work. Um, so it's a big project, it's a really worthy project, I'm really excited about it, uh, but there's lots of challenges again. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, David. Oh, sorry, Angie. No, no, just very briefly, from a local authority perspective, um, absolutely super keen to support this. I think we recognise the challenges, many of which Jeff has articulated. Um, I, I, I like painting this story with the other four work streams, which I haven't quite aligned in my head before I came here, so I think that's a really compelling story, but the, the real challenge is going to come when we need to um, divert our resources, which we will need to do, um, but because we're fra phasing this, um, there's going to be a big challenge for us all about, you know, do the people who are earlier get all of the resources and then we've got a problem down the line? We recognise that those areas we're doing first are the ones most in need, so they're going to have a bigger call on resources. Um, but we will have to be thinking system-wide about the whole of Lancashire and South Cumbria when we come to those resource allocation decisions. Um, and it's not just money, 
it's as much about yeah. skill and engagement um, across the whole system that's going to be really important. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Very good. Right. Answer time. So, first of all, Debbie, I mean, so being consistent, but in some respects, being um, at the same time personalizing it is, is, is quite interesting. So, I'm going to go back to the diagram at 3.4 once again, because what, and you talked about the learning, but right at the very top, in a, in a small font size, just to keep us all challenged, is, is, is it says the model is an integrated hybrid from more conveying our case, which are what they've used this and that just described it's worked very well we're pinching the best we're pinching with pride and we're moving it out to the rest of our um, integrated developers integrated neighborhood teams starting with those most deprived as you said so there will be learning there'll be learning as we go along and i think we've probably also come through that transforming community care program board as well um, Tracy, it's really important we get this right, that we have a realistic offer, and you, it is, we can't promise a gold-plated service to everybody, when in fact all we're going to be able to say is, well, we've done your health check and you can take these tablets, by the way, which I'm not sure you can afford. Uh, we can't do that, so we have to make sure that it's a realistic offer, and we're probably going to have to start small and build up, especially if we start with some of these very deprived communities where there is, we've talked about 20 years of community services, we've got even more years of kind of fun challenge that is built up there where we need to try and do something but do it together and together suddenly you know it would be much easier um jim you're right about the fact they shouldn't have launched it without it coming here first of all so i apologize okay. um, but the place directors are aware of this paper it did come through the executive team it's been signed off by them so they would not be surprised to see this paper um and, and um jim didn't say that no it didn't say that but it, yeah um, and then, Kevin, with regard to working with hospitals, yes, of course, because in many respects, what's also within the full report, report but not the paper, is that we would like to, as we develop um, these neighbourhood teams, is, is to ensure that we have um, in-reach from some of your specialists, your geriatricians, for example, your respiratory physicians, um, so that it enables the team to manage those patients in the community uh, without necessarily having them in the hospital. And that's what we want to develop as well. Um, Jeff, we need to get out on the road. You're right. I think this is. I mean, it's been very well received, but it is something about how do we get some, get get it understood locally, but also get some pace into it as well. And Angie, I want full support. Thank you. Kevin. Yeah. Look again. I think it's a, a, a significant uh, paper, and this is actually quite a significant change in Lancashire and South Cumbria. Um, I guess, um, like the last one, we're at the foothills and we've got time on there. So this is going to be quite a long journey again. Neighbourhood working is at the centre of it. And um, to come back on, on Jim's point about the place, I think to a woman, and they all, like they're all women, they would say that neighbourhood working is going to be critical to, to, to effective place work. And I think the challenge we've got here and I was really pleased with uh, David's introduction in terms of looking at the holistic side of it, is our primary care team need to be the sort of bloom within that neighbourhood system. They're a really important part of it, but they're only part of it. And it, it, it needs to be joined up. And we won't get it right uh, right at the beginning. This is, again, it's, gonna, it's, it's the same as the community services change. We're going to need to constantly innovate and come back and make some adjustments and we'll get some. We'll make some mistakes as well. So I think that 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 approach is is really important. I really welcome the focused and hard nosed approach here of saying actually we've got two or three areas that are really really important. You know, around frailty, around inequalities, and that connection I think with the hospital is also really important in terms of having an early and visible impact on the front door and the back door of the hospital. And I think the challenge I would take from that is I think we need to convert this into some hard numbers. You know, what's going to be the impact on admissions that we can avoid by doing this? What's going to be the impact on reductions in not meeting medical criteria to reside? Things like that. I think, and this is probably a discipline we need to apply to all four 
uh, initiatives as we come through. And, and again, we begin to see some of the connections between you, you know your, your pillar leader here and and what impact does it have. I think that's probably the, um, the thing that I think we need to do a bit more sharpening of the pencils on. But again. This is a significant report, and I think it's part of a bigger picture, isn't it, that we can see in the coming months. So well done to the team. Thank you. Well done. Um, the point that Jeff makes about being out and about on the road, and I think it's been a good process and good engagement. When we think we've done that, let's go and do it again, because we, I mean, we're still in the period where a lot of people are grieving the the. Our primary care leaders are grieving the period in which they have more influence, more autonomy, more ability to share, more resources to to cherish. We, we really need to take people with us um, on all of this. So that's a final, on a very minor point, the last the last piece here we get to is northern parishes. Where on earth is northern parish? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, well done, David. Right, partnership. I'm excited about this now. The partnership formalisation of partnership agreement between our board and the BCFSE sector. Great. Yes, thank you, Chair. So I'm also excited for these to bring this agenda item right today. I'll just um, give a couple of highlights to the to the paper itself. The agreement is also here, so I'm happy to answer any comments or questions. But I will invite Tracy to make some um, introductory comments as well. She's been heavily involved, as has uh, Jane Cass, our Director of Partnerships and Collaboration. Um, so this is a, um, a system and sector alliance partnership agreement. And I think it's a really important time. The, the sector has an invaluable contribution to offer to us, both uh, in Lancaster and South Cumbria, um, across our um, partnership arrangements. And we're building on a really rich and vibrant offer from the sector. And I think that's really important. This is not starting from uh, afresh. So, and this is also not just about business as usual. This is about being more creative and innovative with the sector who have got, as I said, not just a valid contribution, but lots of ideas in how we can help navigate some of our, our challenges ahead. It's really important this, this is looked at uh, across the length of South Cumbria, but also extremely important. It's built into our places, and therefore, through our, the work that we've heard through a number of the papers today, so from the community services perspective in our integrated uh, care teams and all that neighbourhood work that we do, there is a variance of the voluntary sector offer, and I think Tracy will, will pick up on some of that in, in her comments. But actually, what we're trying to do is pull, uh, pull the sector together through an assembly to accelerate our strategic partnership arrangements and that discussion we can have. Um, this is very much a co-produced piece of work, and I think that that's really important. And some of the wording and the tone and the language has been absolutely critical to consider and test out with our partners uh, when we've been forming the agreement because that's really critical to how we're going to work going forward. Um, I, I think this is a really exciting opportunity and I think uh, what we would want to be doing is measuring the success of the continued um, uh, partnership but uh, looking at this through our integrated care strategy work and through some of our transformation programmes that we've heard on today, so how it connects to Fuller and how we're thinking about uh, the work <coughs> that we want to do through the paper sir, and James Broad. So I'm going to pause there because I think it's important to hear from Tracy and then I'm happy to answer any other questions later. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. I think you won't be surprised. I'm delighted to be here talking about, about this um, and particularly delighted as well to have an agenda that has all the connections and links that we've had this morning. It's really great to see it flow in terms of all the things we've talked about and I think this is absolutely as you know it, it fits into to so many of the conversations we've, all, we've already had so uh, it's always nice to come to a meeting where you feel it's all kind of joined up and connected so thank you for some thought gone into that putting this agenda together this agreement um, is something that every ICS across all the 42 areas in the country are doing at the moment it's something that um, has been in development for, for a long time with us, but it's really important, as Craig has said, that to see this as a, 
a building block or a milestone along the way, not really the start of our partnership at all, because I don't know where the other ICSs are in terms of their developments, but I certainly feel that we've really motored ahead in terms of how we work, work in partnership. I think also, as Craig has said, it, it is the culmination of a lot of previous work. The Alliance has done a lot of work in the past with colleagues like Neil Greaves, uh, with colleagues in Lancashire County Council when we were developing an accord for the sector. So we've really used a lot of that insight and intelligence to, to build on this agreement. And I think, as Craig has said as well, now we have the wider assembly across the VCFSE. It was absolutely vital to sense check this, um, to give them a chance to have an input into this as that, that wider sector. Um, as with, with all of, of these kind of agreements or the, or the stages that we get to where we've got something in writing, it, it isn't about the piece of paper, and I'm, I, I'm happy, as is Craig, to, to, you know, to answer any questions about the content of it, but it's about the process of, of arriving here that's important, you know, the relationships that we've built along the way, the conversations that have, have really helped us develop some of that partnership work and some of the plans for the future. And I think I can't emphasise that enough, really, because to me, the, the piece of paper is is a vital stage, but actually it's all about what we've done to, to build to that. And I think also one of the things that I, is really important is that it does feel a sense of the sector really getting behind this, and that's a hard thing to do. We're massively diverse as a, a voluntary sector, and I'm sure you know, you'd say the same about you know the, the kind of the, the ICB. And I know Jane and I have had these conversations, but I think to hear colleagues from right across the hospice movement um, say they are fully behind this and will sign up to it is fabulous. Also, to hear those smaller community groups say we really feel this talks to us and what we're doing on, on the ground is also great. And that again, you know, really pays tribute to Jane Cass and the work that, that Jane's done. Um, working with us as a, as a partnership and particularly the work that Jane's done with uh, Jo Hammett um, to, as, as the programme manager for, for this um, partnership to really make sure that those voices are heard and, and you know you can't underestimate how much effort that takes. Um, for me one of the, the key messages in this is the ICB embracing the VCFSE as a strategic partner and I think that is real recognition of the insights that we have as a sector in terms of how we can feed into and what we bring to the planning, the prioritising, the delivery and the evaluating of health and care. And I think there are so many, as we've talked about this morning, examples and pockets of good practice that, that really can be capitalised on and I think this agreement will give us a platform to do that. And I think also, just picking up on a couple of things, um, if we look at the way in which we're implementing the fuller recommendations and I think you know the conversation we've had about how we ensure that no communities are left behind and that we, we really make sure that people with health inequalities are within all of that you know the scope of all of that work I think this agreement gives us an opportunity to deliver some of that I think it also from the community health transformation work or even when we look wider for instance the mental health transformation work we, we know that this, the role of the sector is absolutely front and centre in, in all of that. So I suppose that's where it kind of picks up on what we've talked about previously. Um, I think, for me, the, the devil is in the detail, and the next part of this is, this won't happen without resources, and that's absolutely essential, that not only is the continuing work around creating the infrastructure that allows this partnership to grow needs resourcing, also, the sector needs resourcing in terms of how it's delivering things. And I know there's a lot of work going on around how we, we look at the way in which resources, in the way that Angie talked about, that big thorny issue about how do we move things towards prevention. I think that speaks to a lot of that in terms of this agreement. So I'll pause there. There's a quite a lot I could say. I'm really conscious of time, but I'm, like Craig said, I'm really happy to take questions. And I know Jane is here in case there are any difficult ones. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is very good. I thought they were very good pay for this. Covers all that you read. You only need to read it once. You understand it. There's no words wasted, but it gives you a full story. <laughs> Actually, I'll go Tina, Jim, Chris to start with. So, like Tracy, I'm delighted that this paper's here today. I think it's 
really, really important and key to all our work. Um, and I think it sets out beautifully, um, and I agree, David, it's very well written and very clear. And I particularly like, for example, the um, on page 80 in my set, <coughs> point five, that joint principles of working culture, because I think it sets out very clearly how, how, how do you get to that point where it absolutely is an equal working relationship, where both sides are respected and are part of it. And I think I really, um, really just commend it and really positive about it. As Tracy beautifully articulates, the devil is in the detail about making this work and taking it forward. But I think with the conversations we've had this morning and the way of thinking very differently, it's really what about um, integrated care should be about and what integrated care boards and, and partnerships should be about is thinking very differently about how we work alongside our communities and use all our assets to really improve people's outcomes. So um, very supportive. Thank you, David. Thank you. That's great, Jim. Thanks. Um, <coughs> I seem to be focusing on procedural issues this morning. I'm, I'm going to do it again now because I'm slightly, just a little bit confused. The King's Fund have just issued a document called Actions to Support Partnership, addressing barriers to working with the BCFC sector in integrated care systems. Tracy mentioned integrated care systems, but this is the integrated care board. And I'm not quite sure whether this is, how, how they sit together. The integrated care system is not, is a different thing in the sense that the integrated care partnership is a different thing than the integrated care board. So it'd be helpful to have just a little bit of clarity on, on that, and just make sure we're doing the right thing. It almost feels like the integrated care system agreement shouldn't be sitting above the agreement with the integrated care board, um, because it's, it, it's broader and wider. So, that, so that's, that's one thing. Um, Tracy also mentioned she's delighted that the trust and others are signed up to this. I think it'd be helpful to actually list within the agreement which partners are signed up to this agreement, regardless. And I'm also, um, which probably won't go down very well, I think the use of the phrase equal partners is not altogether helpful because I'm not so sure we can be equal partners. Uh, if we were equal partners, it'd be as many uh, BCF, see people around this board as ICB people. And, and we would also be, you know, when we've got statutory duties, those organisations have got their own regulations and whatever. We're not, we're not equal partners in, in challenging those things. So there's a phrase, it, I think I understand the sentiment and I completely and utterly agree with it. But it feels like that is not the right phrase to use because there's, there's a legal connotation to equal partners. Thank you. What's two and three noted? Craig, do you just want to do just with this ICS ICB? Yeah, so this is a partnership between the integrated care boards and the uh, sector um, that's represented by the, uh, the Lancashire South Cumbria Alliance representing that sector. So we, it's a part of the integrated care system, but the actual technical element of the partnership is between one organisation and the alliance representing the sector, and that's how the, the partnership agreement is formed. Yeah, I understand that, but, but which, it feels like that's, that's, that's limited in a sense, and it should be, the, the more important agreement I would have thought from Tracy's perspective and, and all the other members is with the integrated care system. I don't, I don't disagree, Jim, the, the, the requirements are for us to have this agreement with the ICB. How we operationalise it and implement it will be through our integrated care system arrangements. That will, that's where the integrated care partnership comes through. And I just think it does get quite confusing, so we're going to try and map this out so we can understand where the governance sits, but actually, more importantly, where, where we do things and how it happens in okay. practice. Thank you. We've got Chris and then Jeff. And others who put their hands up, can you just remind me, please? Thanks, Craig um, and Tracy. So, and Tracy, you mentioned about the community mental health transformation tonight. I think we're in, in a journey of deployment of that, and if we need to pick up pace um, within that, within the system. I look back at how we interacted with this sector, and it's been clunky at best. Um, and we've got some, a few good examples, but more times where we haven't got it right. And I think the assembly and this partnership agreement gives us a real roadmap, a real framework to, to get that right um, as, we, as we finish off the deployment and transformation of our community pathways, which is going to be crucial to stop the reliance on inpatient care and mental health. So, uh, really welcome um, this Thank you. Thank you. Joe, I'm going to feel really mean in a minute because I feel like I've been mean to everyone today asking questions. But I will say, first of all, Working with the VCFSC is one of the most joyful things 
I spent t ten years working in our local hospice, and it was one of the best jobs I ever did. And it, all the interactions are, are, are joyful and great. So, so I'm going to feel mean asking this question. It's not a mean question, but it's a, it's a sort of, it's a sort of a, yeah. I'm just I'm just protecting something, but it's it's a, and it's a genuine question, really. Are you at a stage where this agreement allows you to interact with the whole sector behind you in the whole of Lancashire, South Cumbria, in a meaningful way? In other words, do, do, is there a is there a is there a sign up to the shared values and vision? And, 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 and to reflect back, the alternative side of the coin is, are we enough together to give you meaningful support? So, so are, is the system mature enough that this, this agreement will, will bring a, 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 about a, a positive change? And then I've got a second point, Chair, if I may, and that is, I actually strongly agree with Jim here. I think we're back to front. And, and, and I think this goes beyond this agreement. This goes beyond the fact how we work as a board and with the, IC, uh, and with the ICS, i.e. the health and care partnership. So to me, the health and care partnership around this issue should have some sort of memorandum of understanding where all the partners say, yes, we want to work with the VCF, I see. Uh, and then the partners take it back to their constituent organisations and say, yes, we have this, this agreement here at the ICB and... Lancashire County Council might say they want the same thing or not, I don't know, or they might have it already. But, now, I know that's a, a direct affront to you and Kevin, but... but it, yeah, not uh, the first time. I know, <laughs> I know, and I feel, really, I feel really horrible to say this, but it just to me seems that maybe for expediency we need it here first, and maybe it's an agreement we need and we just need to get on with it, but I just think we need to think through how the two parts of the system work together. Because yeah. the Health and Care Partnership isn't a decision-making body, but... It, it brings or a resource up. deployment body, that's what yeah. yeah. So it's just a thought. Okay, Kevin will come back at, at the end on that. But in terms of the first point, James Tracy, do you want to come straight back? I think it would be impossible, wouldn't it, to say that I'm here representing the whole sector or that any yeah. colleague can come along and represent the whole sector. Uh, no, absolutely not. I think the messages that have come out as the sector have been involved in co-producing this agreement have very much been... I don't think there's anything in this that anybody couldn't really get behind. And, you know, it's, it's by design that it's, it, it's easy to read, it's got the right tone, it's quite succinct, yeah. because there are a lot of people, a lot of diverse organisations yeah. that need to feel this is about them as a sector. Yeah. But no, absolutely not. I would like to just pick up your second point, if I may, David, because I think yeah. it does talk to that, you know, where do we start? Yeah. How, do we, how do we deliver something when we've got a huge big system, yeah. we've got a, you know, diverse communities, and let's yeah. face it, across Lancashire and South Cumbria, we have got some yeah. massive diversity amongst our communities, as you well know, Jeff. But it, I think this is, a, you know, I said this isn't a start because we've been working in, in partnership and there's been relationship building happening a long time, not least with other partners who are part of the, the wider system, because although this is about the the alliance or the sector represented by the alliance and the ITB, it does give us a framework for integrated working, for working as equal partners or, you know, with that concept of we want to work as equal partners. It's almost a, a bit of a philosophy rather than necessarily a, a way of governing things. The, the, it, it, it isn't, deliberately isn't about the ICS because that would be trying to do something far too ambitious and too big. It is, I think, the right approach at the right time, the right stage for now. So it could be positive. <laughs> Kevin? Uh, again, a, a significant milestone. Just picking up this debate around the ICP and um, uh, the ICB. Look, I think uh, we've got a really convoluted landscape. Yeah. If you had a blank sheet of paper, you wouldn't create what well, we're having to work with that. The reality is local government and the NHS are significant partners, commissioners uh, of work with the voluntary sector. And, and probably, to be blunt about it, local government's more mature in this space than, than, than actually the NHS. So I think we've got to have a strategic approach and, and sort of um, 
move beyond what is an important agreement here to actually what are we going to do differently over time. I think there's a huge opportunity to do things differently. I've seen some fantastic lived experience programs, for example, and, and in your patch in Barrow, actually, yeah. and, uh, which really do make a difference. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to use the voluntary sector to do less medicalized models that really do make a difference to, to people and the money goes further. So I think it's important that we have this strategic approach. And I'd be keen to see those areas start to come into fruition when we update our long-term plan. But I think the real measure of success here is, you know, we are living, we're, we're having to manage austerity. So what are the opportunities to do things differently within that context? Um, so the voluntary sector can reach parts of the system and, the, and our populations that actually we can't. So where can we deploy them more? There are probably some areas where we could transfer responsibility to voluntary sector organisations because they'll do a better job and the money will stretch further. But also there are going to be some cases where we can't fund all of the things that historically we have been funding and we're going to have to have some grown-up conversations to say actually we're going to have to stop providing some services. We're going to have to level down in some cases because we can't do it all at the level that, that people are expecting. And, and also we have some really good top performing organisations. I mean I went to the well, really impressed with what they were doing. I went to FCMS in Blackpool. Really star organisations doing great things. Some aren't performing as well. So I think we, I think the, the, the issue here is to operationalise this, isn't it? And, and, and into real areas of prevention, of intermediate care, um, place work, and, and, and really bring it to life. And I think that's our challenge. Good steps, significant milestone, uh, a lot, lot of opportunity here. And I think we just need to get on. But I, I'd like to see this featuring more in our things like our long-term planning features. Where, where are the areas that the voluntary sector could do more for us? And there will be some transfers that come from, from the NHS uh, to, to, to the voluntary sector. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think we all struggle a little bit with this, still about the sequencing and the governance and who's party to this agreement or not. We have to be a bit, uh, take Jim's and Jeff's points on this. But I do think that this is a significant step for us to take. We need to do some of the pitting uh, in play as we go. So on that basis, can I ask the board to approve this? Thank you. Now, uh, in my agenda, um, not only does it say 15 minute break, it says it in, in big font and bold. Um, um, can I take Chairman's license and propose to have a three minute break, please?
Uh, thank you all very much for the prompt uh, return. Uh, remind again, we still we all the Q sticks is pretty difficult. We all need to uh, speak up, please. Uh, we'll think about there's a better way of doing this for next time. Right, finance report month twelve, chief finance officer. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, um, in the packet, the last month of the year, 22-23, so it's the last month, it's the month 12. Um, before I sort of touch on the highlights of the report, just to be really clear that this is based on draft audit reports that have been submitted and um, there are, it is subject to potential changes to that audit approach. But if there are any changes, any technical changes that might happen to these accounts at the end of the year, then they would be approved changes. We're not expecting any big surprises. So I suppose what I'd like to just say is that the key message really in here is that um, the system was given a target to break even um, with a delivery plan of 5% SIP savings plans. We had to deliver 5% savings plans during the year, which was £186 million during the year. And on top of that, we were asked to manage what we reported to the board at the start of the year, when we started in July, £177 million of risk on top of that. So this has been an extremely challenged financial year. Uh, financially challenged year. And I guess throughout the board, the, throughout the year, the board's been monitoring that risk, and we've been seeing a number of corrective actions and things that have been coming through and recovery plans and get well plans and everything to try and land this position. And I'm, I suppose I'm just really, really pleased today to say, be able to say to the board that, you know, we've been given the agreement that we can use the historical surplus made by the CCGs for 27 million. And on that basis, the 27 million um, uh, deficit cost of providers is supported by that, that brought forward uh, historical underlying surplus. And, and that means that on a rolling basis, we are breaking even and meeting our financial targets. Um, uh, uh, as agreed with NHS in NHS England. So I think this is really exceptional work by all the providers, by all the partners, by all the people who have been working to do this because the, the risk has been enormous this year. So to get to this position it is, is a real achievement. Um, because of the size, I guess, of the risk and the, and the savings plans that we've had to deliver during the year, there's a, a, a large element of that that has been done on the currently, which is then moving us into this next financial year that we're in now. So obviously I'm talking about last year and we're in May. Um, it, that does mean that it gives us a greater challenge, as Kevin pointed out at the start of the year. And we're going to have more conversation in part two about the, the next year's plan. But Kevin did speak in his report at the start about a number of schemes and, and there are things being worked up now to look at for next year. It's really important that we, 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 we focus on those. So I, I didn't really want to dwell on it because it's a fairly short report. It means it's saying that we've met what we, what we set out to do um, uh, and it's a good achievement. So I, I think I'll just end now and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Well done everybody balancing the ICB. Well done, Chris, balancing the clock for us. Kevin, anything you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> there is, Davis, there is, there is absolutely. So I would um, support Sam's position that it's a um, tremendous effort by all providers and all provider organisations and the ICB getting to this place. But it's not just about the money. What we've been able to do is balance the money, but balance it with improving staff satisfaction improving performance around elective recovery, cancer recovery, and our agents and emergency crew are some of the best, certainly in the Northwest and in the North. So what we've been able to do is actually have a really balanced scorecard to manage the risk, manage patient safety, deliver against performance. And I think that is a tremendous outcome for the ICS and for all of the providers in the ICS. And I think we should minute that and we should applaud the work that's gone on across all organisations. Well said, Thank, Thank you, David. Thank you. I knew you meant to say that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Any points for Sam? Okay, excellent. Thank you. You carry on, Sam. Okay, so the next paper we have is the Joint Capital Resource Use Plan, which is a requirement now for our board to publish this on the website and to, to bring it to this meeting. And it sets out the capital plan for the next year. So we've, we've had the budget here from a revenue perspective. This now sets out the capital plan. So as soon as possible after the year end, I think this was submitted at the end of March, we, we bring this to the board. 
This is then shared, and it's, it, as well as being on the website, it's shared with our partners, the ICP, and the Health and Wellbeing Boards, and it's put together by NHS providers and submitted at the end, end of March by, as a collective, as a collective <coughs> group of, of providers in the ICB. So the appendix in here contains a submission that we actually made, uh, and a large part, when we look at our capital plan for any, for any one, one year, um, they call it CDEL, but it, it's basically our, our, our delegated expenditure limit for capital that we can, we can use. Most of it, the majority of what we get, unfortunately, just barely covers the operational requirements of, of maintaining the estate. And if, I think if any of us have been around our hospitals, you know that there is a lot of work that's required and a lot of backlog maintenance, and, and most of our capital does get spent in that area. So although it looks quite a large sum, over 100 million, it, it tends to be operational capital that we need to just maintain and stand still. However, there are some priorities that are made um, uh, sort of available nationally, but they're fairly prescribed areas, but we go through a process internally across our, across our system of agreeing what the priorities for those should be within, within those areas. For, so for example, frontline digitalization is one of the areas, and we've heard today from Asim and, and from the discussion we've had throughout that how important the integrated care record is and the, and the new EPR system. So there are priorities in, her, in, in here that relate specifically around, around the digital agenda. There are other priorities that are really around the community diagnostic work, and again, we're talking about really enhancing community services and community diagnostics, and that is a, another big area. And then and the other key area, I guess, is elective recovery, and we have a number of bids that support our elective work and to increase the throughput that we, we need in our systems. So although they're prescribed areas nationally, we locally have, have looked at how we use those across the providers, and there are various groups that I'm sure Kevin could talk more about across providers that look at how we deploy that resource for the coming year. So that, that's probably the main thing, really, that I wanted to cover in that paper, and it's, it will, it obviously, it is now, I think, already, Deborah, on the website, so it is there and available. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. I don't know if this is going to be a mean question or not. Chair. It's okay. But You're sleeping me. well, John. <laughs> <laughs> how do we get, have you got a vision, Sam, an idea of how we get from where we are now to where we need to be with capital expenditure in primary community services to enable Fuller to work? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it isn't a mean question, it's a very good question. And I think what we have in, in, included in here is, is a very limited budget for primary yeah. care. It's around three million and it's, it's, not, it's not a great a great resource. We've got to get really smart here, I mean, uh, in terms of our longer term planning and what we're doing. And what we've got and we've seen over the last couple of months is, a, is much more clarity of our strategic direction. And today we've heard couple of elements of that that become even clearer, particularly around Fuller and primary care. What that's got to be supported with now is, that, is a three to five year financial plan, which is not just revenue, it's capital as well, to think about how we best use it. It's going to be a challenge because we're challenged not just on revenue but on capital, but what we've got to make sure is through the process of developing that plan is that we're putting it in the getting the best return we possibly can in terms of, not I don't just mean financial return, I mean in terms of meeting our objectives for our, for our population. So that's a process we, that we will go through. I actually visited a couple of practices recently and, I, and it became very, very real. I was in Chorley area, but it became very real talking to the GPs and talking to the practices. You know, I could actually see lab, I could see some of the R staff, some of, the, some of our, our, our additional staff being squashed into these, you know, we've got all these additional people. We talked about I, INTs before and how we have that wider multidisciplinary approach. But where do we accommodate these people? There are people trying to work out cupboards and all sorts. So I think it's really, it's really challenging. We need to look at our estate and think about how do we do this properly. So we do need a plan. I haven't got the answers, unfortunately. But, but it's I, in your sight. But it's definitely it's in, in your my, heart. In my, yes. That's what private care wants to hear. Yeah. yeah. I think part of the issue is that in terms of the discretion over new capital resources, We've, we've had the, a hand tied behind our back because we've allowed such a big backlog maintenance bill to grow with neglect of some of these things over the previous years that so much of the hospital uh, and other estate is in a, in a state of repair that yeah. we're all happy with. Is that right, Kevin? It's absolutely the case, and, and I keep saying this, but if you look at the, the Preston site, it's actually one of the worst sites I've ever um, worked on in terms of physicality. The, the A&E department and the 
corridors. It's all, they're always leaking. There is uh, basically there's a set of prefabricated buildings put together. They are not fit for, fit for purpose. And we're having to spend a fortune in terms of maintenance of those facilities. So that's why the new hospitals program and hopefully the success of the new hospitals program is so important, not just for Preston, but for the whole health and social care system across Lancaster and South Cumbria. Are there opportunities for us to look to supplement the investment in primary care premises through more different kind of venture arrangements or looking for other outside investment that we can support Preston with? I think there's probably, um, as we mature and are clearer on our strategy, we need probably with other ICBs across the country to be asking for a more grown-up relationship with NHS England uh, so that we actually have more uh, discretion, a single pot, um, and then you begin to ask those questions about are there other ways of enhancing that growth program. We're probably being investing too little in the capital generally and, and, and too much on, on the other side is, is the reality uh, going forward. So I think it is something we need to rethink, but it needs to be done on the back of probably a more mature strategic plan. Than the plan. And there's also, you know, the good work's been done. So you get a you compare the experience been in the Alfred Barrow Centre in Barrow or the Health Centre in Haysham, Haysham to compared to walking around the corridors of Preston Hospital or even <coughs> Westmont, it's, it's a much better experience. Yeah. Just this three million number just stands out as a yes. paying token, isn't it? Yes, it is. Roy? Just on that point, Chairman, yeah, in, in Blackpool we, we um, built primary care centres and, and um, keep your practice moved into them. You, one of them in the south did that on a 3PD arrangement where they, where they actually, uh, the, the practice actually paid to go into the into primary care centre. Uh, it was a good arrangement, worked well, and uh, they were very supportive of it. So it's just a point that I'd make. The problem with the Alpha Barrett Health Centre, if I may say, was it took 13 years from initial bid to opening. We can't afford 13 years because there'll be nothing left to general practice. We really can't. So we need to be looking at a three to five year program. I think thirteen years is just too long. That's how it long it takes sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. Just fighting for the money. Yeah. Point more taken. Okay, we'll come back on this in future. For now we know this plan. Thank you. Constitution and Governance Handbook. Uh, Sam, before I passed you on this, you see in this paper that one of the constitution changes that we make is to have um, a, non -ex a new non-executive member now because we've gone on so Debbie uh, becomes a full non-executive member of the board uh, which I'm very pleased about and um, uh, whilst the rest of the non-executive members uh, came into this blind and didn't know what it was going to be like until it accepted it. So I'm really encouraged that Debbie, <laughs> Debbie's been had it on trial for a while and still agreed to come on. So thank you very much. Sam, you... Yes, I wasn't really going to say very much, thank you, Chair. It was just really to, 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 to point out that the paper explains that an application has been submitted to NHS England to make some changes to our constitution, uh, which is the thing that guides um, how we organise ourselves to fulfil our duties to our patients and our local population. And those changes are around the additional knowledge that can also some changes to the boundaries around the Cumberland, Westmoreland, Furness and North Yorkshire Council. So those changes have been approved as of the 1st of April. Um, and then we've got the updates to the proposed governance handbook to reflect, reflect the updates from the various committees and that's, that's all documents in the paper. So the board has just asked to note the constitution update but approve the changes to the handbook. Approved? Yeah. Thank you. Use of the integrated care board seal. Yeah, so this one, very quickly, there's a requirement to report the use of the seal um, to the board and the chief executive and I were asked to use the seal to execute three documents in April. They're listed in the document, descriptions are given and the board's asked to note the use. Um, so that's what I was really going to say on that one. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'd love to see a picture of the same. <laughs> That's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Paper note. Performance report, Matt. Well done, Sam. Performance report, Matt. Thanks, David. And um, there's just a few observations from me, and then just a couple of highlights. And I will take it as people have read the paper, um, particularly because of the time. Um, I think the paper, this, this performance report, reflects a lot of hard work by lots of our staff across health and social care. I wanted to start uh, my little slot by thanking everyone for their individual contributions. Um, I do a lot of work across m many of our organisations and I meet a lot of people every month. And I can really uh, emphatically say in this meeting that our goal across all those organisations continues to be improving the services that we provide in some very challenging circumstances, some of which we've talked about today um, across the Lancs and South Cumbria. I am particularly grateful to all our staff and how they've responded to the challenges of the NHS uh, <coughs> staff pay dispute this year and um, the way that we've been able to respond um, during the strike action. And that is as recently as what has been a very challenging weekend um, for us all who, who are involved. Um, so huge thanks to our staff. I also get told many times by many people after I've given the board report, performance report that it feels very uncomfortable if you work in a service where we are uh, shown to be not performing to or above national standards. And again, I want to emphasise that my comments are not reflective of individuals, but more uh, particularly after today's board about the way that our system is uh, modelled and the results that we continue to see. I think the report this month describes uh, some <coughs> of the areas in which we, we are per performing in the top 10 of our ICBs across England and that's really pleasing to see. Um, the report also sh shows some areas, areas where we've plateaued and we do not, we've either plateaued below um, the um, standard um, expected of us or our performance has just stagnated at whatever the point is uh, on the grid. Sadly, there are also some areas where when you benchmark our performance, you, you aren't very pleased with where you see where we land. Um, going last on the agenda today has given me the, op uh, the opportunity to try and triangulate many of the issues that we've talked about and what is the impact of that on, on our performance. And I think you will all agree with me that variation puts almost, or some of the variation that we've talked about today, puts almost impossible demands on our acute services um, who are continuing to try and provide um, to cater for that variation. We are trying to provide services that cater for all of that variation across that provider landscape. And of course, if you put overlay onto that the challenges that we know from a workforce perspective and really importantly a financial perspective, um, it really gives us uh, an important conversation about how quickly we apply some pace to some of the conversations that we've had this morning. Um, just some of the highlights for us. Um, <coughs> our four hour all type attendance um, across our emergency care departments um, <coughs> is up there, um, we were the ninth best out of 42 ICBs um, for April's performance um, and we are outperforming our other colleagues across both the Northwest um, who achieved, uh, the standard now is 96%, we, we've achieved 96.9. Um, in the Northwest we achieved 69.6 and the England uh, average was 71.5. So from our four hour uh, all types performance, I'm pleased that we're able to um, deliver um, some of the best performance the country is able to manage at this time. I'm really sad to report that our ambulance delays uh, for those who wait, uh, the ambulances who wait for over 60 minutes um, hasn't really improved and uh, we haven't seen a sustained improvement we really do have some days of great uh, practice and we have some days when we are really proud of what we do but sadly we've not yet uh, started to either plateau with an improvement or see significant changes 
more work uh, that we collectively know we need to do um, with how we work in partnership with our MWAS colleagues. And again, another area that we don't benchmark well in is how long our patients wait for over 12 hours um, from when they've arrived in those ED departments. And again, I won't sit and try and justify any of those waits. It is a terrible experience for our, uh, our communities um, when they're in that position. I am pleased to say that our occupancy um, is, has reduced in April. Um, it's at the lowest now that it's been um, for most of December and uh, through to March. And that's despite in April um, we have closed numerous of, uh, escalation beds. And I'm sure Kevin will have a view on the impact that that is having um, on some of the flow that we're seeing in real time in the, in the last few days. Um, it's the, the right thing for us to do. That capacity was put in as part of the next paper, part of the winter um, plans that we had. And as we come out of that, um, I'm pleased to tell you COVID and flu numbers are, are, are very low for us. Um, and we continue to see improvements in the amount of patients who are seeking um, hospital admissions in relation to winter type illnesses. Um, so it's good that we've taken that capacity out and it's important that we hold our nerve and we try and keep that capacity out. If we don't keep it out, not only is it very expensive, but it means we have nowhere to grow to when we get the next surge um, of whatever it is that comes our way. I'm pleased to say that our elective numbers, um, whilst the number of patients who are uh, waiting for treatment, um, whilst the number of patients who want to access our services has continued to rise in a, in a, uh, over the last two years. What we are seeing now is a reduction in the, uh, the longest waits that some of our patients have had. And all our providers as part of the annual planning cycle have submitted plans which not only continue to see um, those very long waiters uh, being, uh, being treated in a more timely way, but it shifts their focus from 65 and 52 weeks as well. Um, there's a lot of work, uh, both the monitoring that we put in, but also what our regional and national colleagues do of those uh, improvements. And we continue to see that our improvement benchmarks very well compared with other parts of the country. Um, our num I do give you some advance warnings, that, like I did last month, that our numbers, when, we go, when we're back here at the next board meeting, will look as if they've significantly deteriorated as we have added 10,500 patients to those waiting lists in April when we transferred uh, the reporting of max facts and all the surgery from NHS England into ICBs. So uh, bear with me and uh, look at the detail of the paper and you'll see where those numbers have jumped from. We continue with our theatre transformation improvements and again we benchmark extremely well for the amount of our uh, patients who are able to access their surgical procedures as day cases. And we've also seen a significant improve or improvement in um, the amount of uh, utilisation that we are getting through, through our theatre utilisation schemes. Really sadly, um, the, the, paper, the table on page seven indicates that we've only achieved uh, one of our cancer standards for February, which is the last reporting period for cancer data um, and that was for the faster diagnostic standard. Um, I'm sure colleagues will join with me in saying that accepting cancer um, standards at the level that we are currently reporting is not something that we wish to see continue. I'm going to pause there David because I could be talking for 20 minutes on highlights from the board uh, report. I think that's okay. Cheers. Thank you. I think the the report is developing, um, tells us a better story in terms of the overarching picture. What the theme of our discussions through community services earlier and primary care today is variation, very wide variation in a number of these indicators between what part of our patch and another. And it makes the aggregated number almost meaningless. Because you've got some people at the diagnostics, and others you've got, you've got some patients doing very well, some are doing uh, significantly under underperforming, and a number that adds up in the middle doesn't represent anywhere. So I, I wonder if before I bring others in, I'm sorry, um, through the performance committee, Roy, 
if we if we could look again in particular, I mean, it's the variation. If there's something that we could do is to understand the variation, is it structural? Is it efficiency and productivity? What is it? Because a key measure of our effectiveness as a system is the narrowing of the variation and the leveling up to best standard, whichever we look at. And may, maybe, I mean, others will have suggestions too, but if I could ask some of the diagnostic issues which feed in part into the cancer pathways, if, if through the work of the performance committee we could get a deeper dive into some of into some of the Sorry for going first. We've got Debbie then, Jeff. Thanks, David. I won't dwell on the, the performance issues or challenges that Maggie's drawn out. I think, I think you're doing a fantastic job with the team in terms of focusing the board on those areas of concern, which are a lot more visible as the um, dashboard develops and you're giving us assurance through that report of um, what's planned and what's impacting. There's a couple of areas that didn't flow through from the KPI dashboard into the report, so I just wanted a quick update if that was okay. So one of them was around the finance figures that are on is it page 19, that sort of last table that gives us a financial position in the KPIs. And there's an update on agency spend against plan, which shows that the plan was that it's we're basically behind plan. And because we've not had any minutes from the people board, we've not actually had any update in this meeting about how those agency plans are developing. Um, and the pace behind them, so it'd be quite helpful given the difference just to receive a quick update. Um, and then the other one was around um, the hospital discharge and flow leadership scheme that was mentioned on page 144. So there was a scheme that was planned that looked like it had quite a cultural focus to bring leaders together from health and social care to work together on discharge and flow. And given it's such an issue, I recognise it's not the only thing that we're doing around this. But it just seemed a bit of a wasted opportunity because it's not commenced and I wondered if we know why it's not and if we're doing something different or if there's any learning from that really because it seemed like a great idea. Thanks Debbie. I'll start with the last one because that's the easiest one. Um, I think I mentioned this in previous months as well. I think we've discussed it before. Um, it was a really good idea but the people who were closest to the other schemes absorbed it through. So it's not been lost, it's been developed and delivered uh, elements of it through the other broader schemes. So initially we thought we would lump it separately, but it, when we got going it was decided it was better to be mainstream than some of the others. Um, do James, do you want your agency? So yeah, to, so I'm, um, I'm due to get the most up-to-date figures on Friday of this week. So the, the, the people report, which covers, so the update on all those figures, and I'll get them on Friday from the next week. So I'll receive that on Friday, and preview it goes to every next week. So I'll have all of the dates on, all the numbers um, in terms of uh, specific updates. I've got I've got the numbers for some of our individual providers, but the aggregate numbers will all come, all come to me on Friday for, for a review of that report for all the people, for all the papers. So I'm happy to share mm -hmm. outside of those numbers. In turn, but more generally on the point of, uh, of agency and uh, temporary spend, there's a lot of work and that focus and we will talk about that in the private part, in, in part two this quarter. Um, we'll be reporting back on where we are in terms of the, the, the bank agency scheme. But there's, there's a lot of really good work going on with the providers in, in that space. Jeff. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick comment and then a question. Maggie. So, 8.5 dementia diagnosis rates fits with our story at the beginning. I just think the targets are too low. I'm not sure what it's a target of, but it says 68, 66.7% target. So, just a comment. I think, I think we should aim much higher, aspire much higher. The question is 9.2. I don't understand that paragraph. The first sentence says we're doing more numbers in primary care appointments. The second sentence says we're not, we're, 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 we're not doing enough. I, I, it just seems to contradict itself. Is there, is there some wording missing, or, 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 or I just once again, it's northwest, or once again, it's a national figure. Mm -hmm. So within the northwest, we're better, but with, nationally, we're not. Just the absolute numbers have gone up, but not the rate per population. Ah, right. Then. Okay, I get it. Why come under the English language? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I'll use Jess. Um, say that 
be with me and say, we've, this is at the bottom of the agenda, really, of, the, of this particular meeting, and it probably shouldn't be. And we agree that the uh, we agreed at the last finance performance committee to move the performance report up the agenda because it was at the bottom of that agenda as well. And it's and it's not right that we shouldn't be, yeah. you know, discussing these things uh, last minute. It's it's really important points and issues that are in there that we need yeah. to understand. But I hope the board would join with me actually in, in saying that this report is much improved. Yeah. Um, of course, we used to get a report that was more visual than it was narrative, uh, and I think uh, in, in that terms, this, this, this report has been iterative, it's been really, you know, it's changed since it used to come to the Strategic Commissioning Committee, and then it came to the uh, our Finance Performance Committee, it's changed, it's changed significantly and for the better, and I thank Maggie and the team for that. Um, you're right that we should look into some of these things and drill down into them much deeper, and that's the, uh, that's the point of the uh, Finance Performance Committee. And I think it's, it talks in there about next steps and about the KPIs, all, not all the KPIs are reported within this particular report. And I think it's really important that we, as a finance performance committee, pick up some of those KPIs that aren't reported in, in there. Uh, and we do drill down into those figures and have a look at some of the issues that perhaps Jeff and other people will be remaining. But we have to decide what's, what's looked at by committees and what's looked at by the board. So I think it's about the data that comes yeah. to this board, and I think we have to have conversations about that. That's changed over time, and it has improved. As I said, I hope the board would agree with that. But I think we need to understand what's going to be looked at by the committees, and indeed by the quality committee as well, um, or and what is looked at by the board. So I think it's really important how we get those um, that information um, to those committees to to understand, so that we can have a better understanding and report back through the committee structure into the board. But you're right, you're right, Chairman, about looking at um, a particular a particular item, particular issues and, and looking further into those and drilling down into that and getting more information. Aren't you then back to Maggie? Thank you very much. So just a couple of points that I wanted to pick up. So, you know, we are still maturing this, aren't we? And it's come on a long way, but it feels like as a board we're still spending more time talking about what the report's showing us rather than what the report's telling us. Um, for me, I would like to see a little bit more insight through our next iterations of the report. So um, I'm used to receiving performance reports where the executive would give us an overview which says actually, you know, the dashboard says this, but these are the things you need to be worried about and this is what we're doing about it. So sort of positive assurance then really take us to those areas and that might come through the performance. Committee. I echo your points about unwarranted variation. The dashboard actually doesn't look very good, does it? When we look at the dashboard, it would be great actually to have that up front rather than at the end. Um, but it doesn't look very good, but we need to know the details. So that unwarranted variation is really important. And then I'd like to understand where the learning is. So when I look at, for example, um, the staffing rate, um, Morecambe Bay Hospital Trust seems to do better than all of the other trusts. Um, and indeed, their performance looks better than most of the other providers as well, despite some of the other tags, which might raise an eyebrow. So, what situations do we get more maturity there? I'll just come back on that very quickly, David. I have asked about the report and, and, and saying that perhaps we should have an executive summary at the beginning of that report with um, exception reporting in there that uh, perhaps. Uh, Okay, thank you. Thank you. Back to Maggie. Yeah, some good points there. Um, I think I'm still not convinced that this report is, is is close really to satisfying all our needs. Although I do take the you know the positive points on board around it's improving. Seven months in now, I think what continues to amaze me is some of the papers that we see at exec team, contracts that might be up for renewal, um, and we have, we constantly have to say we can't see this paper in isolation because it will be a contract that's expiring in one of the old eight CCGs, which actually seen in isolation will continue to get us a variation that we see now. And that's so destroying for the people who are preparing the papers and who are waiting for an answer in that one particular place. Um, but we have to keep on bringing it back and aggregating it up. And of course, I think the issue for me then in what does that do for performance is we're a group of people now who are monitoring performance against contracts that have been commissioned in that very disparate way. 
and we, we are seeing, you know, as David made some really good points about the, the aggregation of those results. Now, when we go back and drill in to what, why is Morecambe Bay different from Central Lights? Well, you will see that the contracts and the way things have been commissioned are very different. The basket of procedures that are provided in some of our trusts vary enormously. So it's not an apple and an apple and an apple that we're counting. So I think me and Roy started to have this conversation around the performance committee and what we're actually looking at. We need to see whether the performance we're getting, obviously, does it meet the national standards, but also is it delivering against the contract that we set with those providers in order to um, get that um, national standard, but also, as Jeff said, you know, with the dementia, greater standards than that for our people. So I think we need to do more work on that. And as we get more mature and we see more of those contracts develop, we know exactly what we've commissioned and what we should be seeing in those improvement um, improvements across all of the services that we provide. I think Kevin will have a view around the provider collaborative's role in that as well. There's a memorandum of understanding now and those uh, provider organisations will be able to work in a way, um, hopefully Kevin, I might be bigging this up and it's not quite how you see it, but in a way that is taking away some of the variation by ensuring that the chief execs are cited on what their part to play in some of the delivery is. So um, I hope that helps a little bit. But I, I take on board, I think the summary papers, the dashboard up front would all be much more helpful. Trying to explain the nuances, though, in how it's constructed is going to take us a bit longer. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with Maggie. It, it's, it's a start, but it needs to go a lot further. So if you just look at the, the four acute trusts, you really can't compare the four acute trusts because they have a very different basket of activity. So if you look at Lancashire Teaching as an example, it's a tertiary centre. What you really need to be doing is comparing Lancashire's performance against other tertiary centres, say Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, Sheffield. So that probably needs to be built in, into the report itself. So, so there's a lot of nuance in here that we need to, we need to think about, and we can, and we can work with Maggie, and we can build it in. But I just want to pick on, on, on Angie's book, which is a really good point in terms of the sharing of good practice. And that's absolutely what we are committed to. We've got an improvement collaborative across all of the organisations, and we do share that good practice. And there's a lot of good practice that goes on in each of the organisations. I think that the real trick for all of us, and this is where the ICB and the ICS becomes really powerful, is to try and get that standardisation, however, of clinical practice across all of the organisations. And the more that we can push that standardisation and push it up so we don't have variation or unwanted variation, there's always going to be some because of what says it in the basket. But un un unnecessary variation is what we should be looking at because that's at the root of, of, of waste of resources, but it's also at the root of clinical safety issues, and that's where we need to focus our energy and effort as an ICD board. Oh, as we've reflected today and in previous meetings as a system, the ways of working, the operating models, call it whatever, are still settling down. But we need to try and find a way of connecting together. We have a, we have a statute role as a commissioner of services. But we've all got higher expectations than sitting in here saying these are the contracts we've got with people and they're not delivering at all. That, that ain't quite good enough. Likewise, commentating on where things are at. Uh, uh, we have an inclination to compare ourselves with other parts of the country when we're doing well and less so when we're not. So, commentary doesn't add much value to any of this and doesn't justify us. Being contract managers isn't quite enough. It's understanding how we can build the different dynamics of the system to become more self-improving, self-regulation. You know, we'll listen from the quality committee to things that have gone wrong as well as things that have gone well. How do you contextualise that? We, we, we haven't talked today about CQC reports on our providers that highlight some problems. That has to fit into the picture. We know that all our trusts are at below standard in terms of the oversight framework generally. And we still haven't got to the point where we can put all these different pieces into the mix and, um, and have that bigger discussion about 
what the big picture looks like, where are the priorities, I agree with that, where are our priorities for intervention and action, and the impact it then has on all these different pieces. It is not easy for us to do that to complex business with a lot of people on this pitch, but that's what we should continue to aspire to and aim for. Any other points? Final item today is urgent and emergency care board ashore and framework. And I should tell you, I share, I hope Jim doesn't mind, I share the privacy, the, the conversations Jim and I have. It's like a it's like a an excerpt from a grumpy old men bill <laughs> where we sit and, and discuss our ongoing frustration with partially implemented. What on earth do you do with partially implemented? There's another board that I chair where we talk about moderate assurance. What on earth do you do with that? <laughs> Maggie, over to you. Thank you. I cast your comments on partially implemented up for the national team who insist on having it as one of the um, frameworks for how we report. This is the last time you'll see this paper. I've said this in previous months now. Um, it was a paper that we were mandated to bring to the board to um, oversee the schemes that we introduced for winter, um, of which you will see many are completed and there are some which have been partially completed or there was one that wasn't started at all. Um, overall, Kevin mentioned before some of the uh, performance improvements that we've made. We remain grateful for the funding that we got last winter to go into these areas. Some of the schemes have delivered um, a really had a key um, place in some of the improvements that we've made. I think Kevin we will want to do some further evaluations of the impacts of those schemes. In fact, we are doing it through some of the uh, check and challenge meetings that we've been having um, from a financial perspective, trying to introduce a language of return on investment on all of these schemes so we know where uh, we need to continue that investment as we go forward. And um, again, picking up on old David's comment around contract management, it's not enough, it's not enough by a long way. But what we really need to do is have models of care which are uh, commissioned and con contracted in a very positive way so that we know what we're expecting to see and deliver. And these schemes have helped with some of that during the winter period. Um, some of the money that we, um, we will get up front in the contract this year is to, in it to enable us to keep some of the schemes going because we get so frustrated, don't we, every year when we stop something that has worked well, uh, only to start it again when we try and find the staff later in the year. So I don't feel there's much more to add to this paper than what you've read um, in it, David. Um, I all, only to say there's a lot of monitoring both regionally and nationally, and um, we've had some very good feedback on the delivery of the schemes. That's very good. Jim? I suppose continuing the grumpy old man approach. Um, the point you made about you get this kind of an average and it doesn't necessarily represent the other organisations. That's the bit about partial that most bothers me. And there's, there are three or four areas in here where through the Finance and Performance Committee, and I'm going to talk to Maggie about this later if I could, uh, where it would be really helpful to know the answers for each individual organisation. There's a section on emergency department, there's a section on inpatient management, where it's all partial. We need it broken down by trust. Later on, there's, there's a, a section on... Um, which is, is scary, actually. It's got continuing to embed the 10 best practice interventions at a time when we're in an absolute crisis. Not one of them is other than partial. And you think, we're being told these are the 10 best practice interventions and we've not implemented them. There's also one about um, reporting performance to the board, and that's partial. Surely that can't... Surely every organisation is reporting performance data to the board. So knowing who isn't performing would be a starting point for looking at this kind of variation and understanding that in a bit more detail. So hopefully, uh, we've got a performance, transfer performance committee next week. I would like us to start looking into that level of detail at least at that meeting. Yeah. That's the Thank you. Point taken. Great. Any other points? Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Not been notified of any items of any other business. Apologise to people sat around the table and people observing our business today that we've overrun by uh, 30 minutes, but it was some important discussions and it was important to take all the contributions on those. We next meet back at the Health Innovation Campus in Lancaster on the 5th of July. I look forward to seeing everybody there.
I'm sorry, we have got, we're going to have a meeting on the 21st of June as well, uh, just an extraordinary meeting around the accounts. Have we not need to mention that? Not the extraordinary meeting. Does it necessarily have to be in public? No. But just to note that. That's all. <coughs> <coughs> 